my lovely, lovely imps. Today, together, we are going to go through President Joe Brandon's State of the Union Address 2024. Yes, that's right. Together, we are going to go through something um, that we always have done on this channel. We've basically watched every State of the Union since I started my channel, so we're going to do it again. And we're going to talk about the politics, because you guys know I love talking about politics, even when I don't. Um, and there's a lot to talk about right now, because um, Joe Biden f has put himself in a very weird place with regard to the American electorate. Um, <laughs> did you guys see, did you all see him welcoming the Nikki Haley voters the other day on social media and television, I believe? Which is a kind of crazy thing to do where he's like, you know, uh, you all might not like Donald Trump, but we also don't like Donald Trump. Come vote for me. And I feel like that's the most Democrat thing to do. Because, like, remember, like, there, nobody said shit when DeSantis, like, like, Donald Trump barely said anything when DeSantis dropped out. Oh, okay, sorry, I should revise that. Donald Trump said that he's been spending lots of time with Ron DeSantis' wife when Ron DeSantis uh, stepped out of the race. Why the fuck are Democrats spending their time congratulating and inviting the voters of a, like a second-rate Republican candidate who has some of the most deranged politics in the world to come join them. It is such a strange move. And people might go, well, yeah, but don't you think that Joe Biden like needs all the votes he can get? Yes, but he actually alienates more people by being welcoming to the strange, strange people in Nikki Haley's audience instead of just letting it happen. He could, he could just let it go. It's not like it was a momentous historical event or anything, but he went out of his way to be like, come on, come on in and join us. Well, a lot of his electorate don't feel like they want those people to, to hang out. They don't agree with them at all. In fact, their worldviews are completely opposite. So Joe Biden has been basically doing all of this shit to try and reach out to what he sees as like a reasonable Republican. But that demographic just doesn't exist to the same degree as it used to. There are no Republicans in America who will consider voting Democrat, okay? That is a thing that maybe used to be the case in like the 90s, but it's not anymore. The one, the most single unifying trait of the modern American Republican Party is owning the libs, okay? They hate Democrats. It is the most tribal the Republican Party has basically ever been. The Republicans become Republicans because they, more than anything else, they hate Democrats. So the idea that you're going to get Republicans to vote Democrat because they have some, you know, conceptual issue with Donald Trump is just like, bro, what? And in the meantime, him playing to that audience and pitching to that audience shakes the already shaky um, faith that his own voters have in him. Democrats do not feel strongly about Joe Biden. His approval rating is terrible. He's not even popular in his own party. People see him as meandering, as a uh, as somebody who compromises when he doesn't need to, as someone who's weak on the topic of genocide. That is a terrible thing to be perceived as. Um, they see him as potentially infirm, unable to lead, too old. This is not a good state for him to be in. And I'm very interested because believe it or not, I have not seen essentially anything outside of a handful of very short clips from this State of the Union. So this is going to be a very interesting thing for me to watch together with you all and analyze to see how he angles his rhetoric going into his new year. And it's got to be a good one because let me tell you right now, uh, Joe Biden is the only one to blame if Joe Biden loses against Donald Trump, okay? I want you guys to really 
internalize that fact. Joe Biden had this in the bag. Donald Trump is so unbelievably unpopular. Donald Trump has the biggest audience of people who just absolutely hate him, okay? And for very good reason. Winning against Donald Trump should be a cakewalk at this point, okay? The amount of anti-Trump people is massive. It way outnumbers the Trump cult, okay? And the Trump cult might be very loud, but Trump really offended a lot of people's basic sensibilities and their understanding of the flow of American politics, okay? And somehow, Joe Biden has managed to fumble that lead. And there's a couple of ways in which he's done that. But one of the most significant is how badly he has fumbled his own response to the ongoing ethnic cleansing that Israel is perpetrating in Gaza. Joe Biden has essentially failed on every single front and his entire administration has failed not just they haven't just failed they've failed spectacularly there are clips after clips after clips cycling all over the internet on every platform not just one social media of of uh of of journalists asking specific questions about the horrific and nightmarish scenes that are coming out of gaza and the only thing that the White House press secretary has to say is, we unequivocally support Israel's right to self-defense. Um, next question. We unequivocally support Israel's right to self-defense. Uh, next question. And they will be like, what about the flower massacre? What about the bombing of a hospital? What about this, the, the death of a bunch of children in a clearly preventable incident? Uh, we, we, uh, 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 we clearly, we, we, uh, we unequivocally support Israel's right to, uh, to defend itself. Next question pathetic okay there is just they are asleep at the wheel and it is severely severely hurting their ability to motivate their own voters a lot of people and i've seen this a lot on the internet i've seen a lot of liberals a lot of joe biden fans who are basically angry at lefties which is really weird they're angry at lefties they're angry at uh at at liberals they're angry at the average american for not doing enough to hype up Joe Biden right now. And to me, that is an absurd position to take. Joe Biden is the fucking president of the United States. He has the world's most powerful political machine behind him currently. The currently single most powerful person on, plan on the planet Earth is Joe Biden and his Democratic Party. And somehow it's the fault of the average American voter and or the, the left minority. It's an absurd claim to make, especially when we know that Democrat voters just simply outnumber Republican voters. We know if every Democrat voter and every Republican voter in the country voted, the Democrats would win the popular vote every single time. They would likely win the electoral college vote every single time by like a huge margin. And so somehow when, when Joe Biden drops the ball so hard that his own voters are having second thoughts and don't feel the, the, the emotional urge to get super involved in politics on his behalf, it's somehow their fault for not, it's, 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 it, is the lit, it is the mentality that the beatings will continue until morale improves. It is such a terrible uh, uh, inability to take responsibility and I hate it. So I wanted to say this and I wanted to spend a little time just talking about this before we jump into it because this is what I've been seeing. And I wanted to stress the need for Biden to have a strong motivating message of actually taking responsibility for him and his party's current position of power. Uh, we'll see if he does that. We'll see if we've, we'll see if he does that. It's, uh, it's wild. Um, yeah, I, I have, I've actually had numerous people. I did a video, um, 
I did a bit not to not to distract further before we jump into this, but I did a video talking about one of my personal failings with regard to critiquing Biden. People got very mad at me about that video. And when I talked about this subject on social media, I was flooded with uh, liberals who were basically trying to tell me that it's uh, that it's everyone's fault except for Biden if he if he starts losing the election. And you can tell that the Democratic Party and its operatives are nervous that that's the case. Otherwise, why would they be breaking out all of the excuses this early? They know there's a real risk that he loses. And instead of saying, okay, shit, we need to analyze and restructure our approach, uh, they go, uh, you guys, they start setting up the gaslighting in advance. Oh, it's going to be your fault. It's going to be the fault of the left who was just too critical. They were so mean to the president of the United States. They were so, they were so rude and critical and they just couldn't put it aside. They, they're going to say, oh, it was these, these no voters who realistically are people who felt completely, who already voted for Joe Biden in the past, but who felt completely unlistened to, completely demotivated, who've lost touch with politics and don't care to listen to smug assholes talking down to them. Uh, they're going to scream that it's people who have too much principles when the, when the Democratic Party, and this is fucking important, the Democratic Party urges people constantly. Joe Biden himself has told people, vote your conscience. And then when people take that message that the Democratic Party puts out and go, well, my conscience says I can't support somebody who's refusing to acknowledge a ongoing mass killing event of innocent people, of civilians, a horrific genocidal push to, to clear all of this, all of the people out of uh, out of the Gaza out of Gaza Strip, and then they go, "What the fuck is wrong with you, the Democrat? What the fuck is wrong with you? How dare you vote your conscience in that way? When we said vote your conscience, we meant vote for us." Pathetic. It's pathetic. <sighs> And another thing that happens is that people will then go, well, what, you think that Trump is better? No, obviously not. In fact, I think Trump is a goddamn disaster. And I think that Trump would be a bigger disaster than Joe Biden for sure. But that doesn't change the fact that Joe Biden has blown his own goddamn lead, okay? Joe Biden is the one who is losing the election for Joe Biden right now. So with all that said, shall we jump into the State of the Union? Are we ready? Because I'm ready. Let's do it. Let's jump in. I almost started playing the wrong video. Here we go. Okay, first notes. Not gonna lie. Kamala's looking really good now. Wow. That's a sharp look for Kamala. He, wow. Good evening. Good evening. If I were smart, I'd go home now. This is <laughs> okay, good start. Good start. Good start. I'm sorry, but uh, this is this is this is not a substance critique. But Joe Biden is the best when he's like a when he's perceived as like a jovial grandpa that you can rely on. That's his literally, historically, that's his strongest, uh, his, his strongest mode. I know that lately they've been leaning on the dark Brandon thing. Talk about killing a meme. The dark Brandon thing only worked as an ironic joke. And the joke was that he was going to go sicko mode and he was going to put Trump in jail or something. And he didn't do any of that. 
obvious. They didn't even do anything even close. So they failed on the, the dark Brandon front. They could have probably done something with that. But um, they started leaning into the dark Brandon memes right as right as the the uh, ethnic cleansing in Gaza began. And that's a really bad look. When you're like, yeah, dark Brandon. And by dark, I mean, you know, that I look the other way at genocide. Y yeah. So you know what? I'll give him this. Strong start. By the way, thank you very, very much for the raid, President Sunday. Come on in, squids. Come get comfortable. We are currently uh, angrily and also comedically reviewing the State of the Union uh, by President Joe Biden. And then we're going to have a very interesting conversation that's right up your alley after this. We're going to be talking about democracy. And we're going to be watching a really good video on democracy. So come in, get comfortable. Thank you very, very much for the raid. And welcome. We would love to have you. Let's continue. Let's continue. Speaker, Madam Vice President, members of Congress, my fellow Americans, in January 1941, Franklin Roosevelt came to this chamber to speak to the nation. And he said, I address you at a moment unprecedented in the history of the Union. Hitler was on the march. War was raging in Europe. President Roosevelt's purpose was to wake up Congress and alert the American people that this was no ordinary time. Freedom and democracy were under assault in the world. Tonight, I come to this same chamber to address the nation. Now, it's we who face an unprecedented moment in the history of the Union. And yes, my purpose tonight is to wake up the Congress and alert the American people that this is no ordinary moment either. Not since President Lincoln and the Civil War have freedom and democracy been under assault at home as they are today. What makes our moment rare is the freedom and democracy are under attack at both at home and overseas at the very same time. <clears throat> overseas, Putin of Russia is on the march, invading Ukraine and sowing chaos throughout Europe and beyond. Interesting angle. If anybody in this room thinks Putin will stop at Ukraine, I assure you, he will not. Yeah, people are saying Slurpee Joe. I noticed that as well. I really hope he fixes that up. That is, well, it's not a, it's not a strong look. Let's continue. But Ukraine, Ukraine can stop Putin. Ukraine can stop Putin if we stand with Ukraine and provide the weapons that needs to defend itself. That is all. That is all Ukraine is asking. They're not asking for American soldiers. In fact, there are no American soldiers at war in Ukraine, and I'm determined to keep it that way. But now, good to bring that up. Assistance to Ukraine is being blocked by those who want to walk away from our world leadership. It wasn't long ago when a Republican president named Ronald Reagan thundered, "Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall." Now, This is the type of shit that I'm talking about, by the way. Drawing a comparison between himself and Ronald Reagan, saying, yeah, I'm here, I'm Ronald Reagan now, is like, that is the thing, that, that does not, that is not going to sell well to the people that he needs to convince to vote for him right now. And um, also, now, I, I, I think overall, the, uh, the the sort of framing of, of Ukraine as a responsibility is probably the right move for him. Uh, there are obviously portions of the left that are going to see that as confirmation of what uh, they worried about that that uh, you know that Ukraine is is a cynically is a cynical tool in uh, the sort of uh, vying for American control of the world. Which is true. It is. Everything that America does is a cynical ploy to increase its power. That's just, that's how states work. 
Um, but to be honest, that portion of the left is not exactly who he needs to reach right now. And uh, if he's trying to beat Donald Trump, uh, making this a this making this a a issue of this type is probably a good move uh, for communicating to his base that he's he's committed on this particular issue. That said, I don't think that comparisons to Ronald Reagan are a good call. And honestly, it's kind of telling, isn't it? Um, like Ronald Reagan. <laughs> I don't know, uh, the, the, the Ronald Reagan uh, uh, privatiz march of privatization and, and, uh, and I don't know, scything, the ca carving out of the, uh, of, of the American working class is one of the things that people have been most worried that Biden will represent, that Biden will basically sort of be a mouthpiece to vaguely state that he supports Americans while ultimately putting policies into place that will re remove power uh, uh, from the working class of America. And I don't know. Um, kind of seems like a bad move to compare yourself to Reagan in that regard. Reagan is not well liked by Democrats. Uh, there is a per very particular type of heavily invested neoliberal that really thinks Reagan was a stand-up guy, but that is not a popular position. That is a niche. Let's continue. Now my predecessor, a former Republican president, tells Putin, quote, do whatever the hell you want. That's a quote. A former president actually said that bowing down... Um... Delance says he's not comparing himself to Ronald Reagan. I already seen the speech. She stopped halfway through the Reagan Trump sentence. Yes, he is comparing Trump to Reagan, but he's also comparing himself to Reagan because he says he's saying, oh, yeah, look at where Republicans are. Me? I'm doing what Reagan would have done. Donald Trump? Look at where he is. It is implicitly both. He is obviously comparing Donald Trump to Reagan. But he's also comparing himself to Reagan. Anyway, let's continue. I'm a Russian leader. I think it's outrageous, it's dangerous, and it's unacceptable. <laughs> America is a founding member of NATO. The military alliance of democratic nations created after World War II prevent, to prevent war and keep the peace. And today, we've made NATO stronger than ever. We welcomed Finland to the alliance last year. And just this morning, Sweden officially joined, and their minister is here tonight. Can they stand up? Welcome. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And they know how to fight. Mr. Prime Minister, welcome to NATO, the strongest military alliance the world has ever seen. I say this to Congress. We have to stand up to Putin. Send me a bipartisan national security bill. History is literally watching. History is watching. If the United States walks away, it will put Ukraine at risk. Europe is at risk. The free world will be at risk, emboldening others to do what they wish to do us harm. My message to President Putin, who I've known for a long time, is simple. We will not walk away. We will not bow down. I will not bow down. In a literal sense, history is watching. History is watching. Just like history watched three years ago on January 6th, when insurrection stormed this very capital and placed the dagger at the throat of American democracy. Many of you are here on that darkest of days. We all saw with our own eyes the insurrectionists were not patriots. They'd come to stop the peaceful transfer of power. 
to overturn the will of the people. January 6 lies about the 2020 election and the plots to steal the election posed a great, gravest threat to U.S. democracy since the Civil War. But they failed. America stood. America stood strong and democracy prevailed. We must be honest. The threat to democracy must be defended. My predecessor and some of you here seek to bury the truth about January 6th. I will not do that. This is the moment to speak the truth and to bury the lies. Here's the simple truth. You can't love your country only when you win. As I've done ever since being elected to office, I ask all of you, without regard to party, to join together and defend democracy. Remember your oath of office is defending us all threats, foreign and domestic. Respect. Respect free and fair elections. Restore trust in our institutions. And make clear political violence has absolutely no place, no place in America, zero place. Again, it's not, it's not hyperbole to suggest. Okay, so there's a couple things I'm going to talk about here. First off, um, overall, probably a pretty good statement to make, um, overall. And the reason I will say that is uh, explicitly using the, the, pretty much the biggest central platform you're going to get uh, the State of the Union has a lot of eyes on it. A lot of people talk about it. We're talking about it right now, obviously. Um, and a lot of people pay attention to it. Using that to explicitly um, target the the fact that, that that there was so much falsehood involved in the, the narrative that has been presented around January 6th. And also to explicitly denounce it. And also to explicitly call out the... Uh, the, the previous president's involvement in that particular event is a good move. Unfortunately, it does ring a little hollow um, given the fact that um, if this is true, if it is, if January 6th represented an ultimate threat to democracy, why have the Democrats been so lackadaisical in their approach towards January 6th? Why have they, um, why have they treated Donald Trump with comparatively such kitty gloves if it's true and i tend to believe that it is a pretty the january 6 was a pretty obvious uh state statement of intent if the the execution was obviously quite embarrassing um we've talked about all that we've watched it all in the past but the statement of intent uh in january 6th and the very clear uh not just direct endorsement by donald trump but the but the the involvement of basically all of donald trump's inner circle all of donald trump's political allies were directly involved in the in the creation of an organization of of january 6th in some way or another like we talked about uh uh how uh uh T turning points usa had buses and buses of people that they deliberately brought to the camp to to the capital knowing that there was a good chance it was going to pop off that day they were talking about it they were planning it they were giving away bus tickets to people in affiliated with their organization to get as many goddamn bodies there as possible and their messaging was everything everything just below the line of saying you guys gotta pop off hard you guys gotta go wreck some shit they were agitating like crazy okay and if that's true um the 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 political campaign against the disqualification of donald trump should be so much stronger this should be something the democrats are hitting every single day they should be pulling out all the stops and they're not now, on the contrary, 
most Americans are not going to think about that particular aspect. But they could be. If Joe Biden used his pulpit, if the Democratic Party used their messaging systems to continually focus on this, the political energy against Donald Trump as so, as a, a anti-democratic freak would be more present. But people don't care because they haven't heard it. They've heard CNN talking heads loosely and vaguely talking about January 6th. They've heard vague references from uh, Joe Biden from time to time, but mostly they've heard silence from Joe Biden. Joe Biden is a, he doesn't make a whole lot of public appearances, nor do his representatives. Kamala Harris has been quiet as a mouse for the last few years. They could have had Kamala out there fucking pushing this shit everywhere, every day, if it's truly the greatest threat to democracy as they say it is which I do think it's a big threat, maybe not the greatest. Now, of course, there's something a bit strange um, that, that Joe Biden said at the end of this, which of course is there is zero room for political violence in America. And it, that's, that's where my job as a lefty comes in to tell you guys how fucking bullshit that statement really is. Um, political violence is a daily experience for Americans, okay? Political violence is what the state does. That is what Joe Biden does. You guys remember Joe Biden saying, you know, don't shoot him in the face, shoot him in the leg. You remember that speech, that infamous speech that he gave in response to uh, the the uh, BLM protests? Um, political violence, the idea that you can make a statement from the seat of the president, political violence has no place in America when political violence is, oh, and, and it's especially absurd to talk about when Joe Biden just capitulated with, with Greg Abbott. He capitulated when Greg Abbott was, was making a push to take the, the National Guard in, in Texas to deliberately, uh, put razor wire in the way of innocent people, okay? In the way of unarmed, everyday people who are trying to cross the border. Whether or not you feel that, that, uh, that, you know, it's illegal or bad or whatever to cross the border, which, of course, uh, the asylum process requires that you declare a need for asylum on American soil, which kind of means that if you want to declare asylum, you kind of got to get across there first because you can't exactly get in any other way. Kind of an interesting setup. Almost seems like that situation is designed to do as much violence as possible to people trying to save their, their, their own and their family's lives. And that Joe Biden just capitulated to that guy and is now offering freely offering the Republicans, we want to come to a deal on immigration. There's a flood of people pouring across the border, giving in to, not, to their rhetoric, giving in to their fear mongering so that they can do political violence. This idea that Joe Biden is against political vi violence is fucking bullshit. And it needs to be called for what it is, a load of crock. Joe Biden uses political violence perpetually. What do you think it is when you, when you give billions of dollars to your ally so that they can mass slaughter civilians? What do you think that is? That is political violence. What do you think it is when you maintain a drug war, which Joe Biden is still doing, maintain a drug war that puts people in fucking prison for life that gets people beaten, killed, uh, stripped down, blasted with chemicals, shoved into iron uh, barred cells because of a, a, a handful of marijuana leaves. That's political violence. That is using violence to assert your political worldview. So his idea, this, this is, it's a load of crock. And it's absurd that he would even say that especially that he would say that in response to the January 6th situation. All right, let's continue. Let's continue.
History is watching. We're watching. Your children and grandchildren will read about this day and what we do. History is watching another assault on freedom. Joining us tonight is Latoya Beasley, a social worker from Birmingham, Alabama. Fourteen months ago, fourteen months ago, she and her husband welcomed a baby girl thanks to the miracle of IVF. She scheduled treatments to have that second child. But the Alabama Supreme Court shut down IVF treatments across the state, unleashed by a Supreme Court decision overturning Roe v. Wade. She was told her dream would have to wait. What her family had got through should never have happened. Unless Congress acts, it could happen again. So tonight, let's stand up for families like hers. To my friends across the aisle, don't keep this waiting any longer. Guarantee the right to ABF. Guarantee it nationwide. Like most Americans, I believe Roe v. Wade got it right. I thank Vice President Harris for being an incredible leader, defending reproductive freedom, and so much more. Thank you. My predecessor. They, yeah, they had decades to make Roe v. Wade law. Uh, <laughs> this is this is what we call kicking the can. This is Joe Biden, after being in power for four years and making no progress to meaningfully protect abortion, kicking the can to a Congress that he doesn't have full control of. It is uh, the, uh, the, the in vitro fertilization, the IVF issue is a serious issue. For those who don't know what he's referring to, um, abortion bans in Alabama have made it functionally impossible to legally uh, uh, do in vitro fertilization because in the process of in vitro fertilization multiple eggs will be fertilized and uh the one that is basically the he the, the healthiest one will be implanted and the rest will be discarded um and that is now illegal under alabama abortion law absurdly of course um it's a good thing for him to bring up but it rings very hollow. And this is one of the issues, by the way, uh, I focused in the very beginning of my of this conversation on the uh, Gaza issue. Um, but abortion is an issue where the Democratic Party's lack of fervor, the Democratic Party la l like lack of a sense of urgency has completely uh, shut off the minds of some of their electorate. It is one of the most important issues to American voters, and they've been zipped right up about it. They've done basically nothing except for defer to Congress. That's it. Oh, we want Congress to make it law. We want Congress to make it law. And they've done basically nothing except continually say that. They've exerted no pressure. They haven't used the office of the president in any way. They've been, they've They've not truly fought for this. And people have seen that. And it, they've turned off. They go, oh, the Republicans just took away my right to abortion. Why should I care about any of this? You told me I was going to be safe if, if Donald Trump wasn't elected. I voted for you and you didn't protect me. Why should I trust anything that you have to say? And this is a real thing that Joe Biden has to deal with. And going up to the State of the Union and just doing the same thing. Oh, yeah, uh, Congress needs to do it. Take a look at this real quick. Just take a look at this real quick. We're going to watch just right back here, okay? Look at how many, look at how this room is split. They stand up. The Dems all stand up. The Republicans don't. You are not going to get, convince the Republicans uh, that they can vote their conscience in favor of abortion because they don't believe that you have a right to abortion. You have to have a more strong-armed approach to this uh, as the president of the United States, you have to be willing to fight tooth and nail to play a little fucking dirty. You can't defer to Republicans. And that's what they're doing. They're standing up and going, Republicans, you got to do the right thing. Make them do the right thing or come up with another path. You see, you see, you know, no, just look at the differences between Donald Trump and Joe Biden's approach. Donald Trump, 
anytime that bitch wanted something, he would, if he couldn't get it through telling people to vote the way that he wanted, he would, he would aggressively utilize executive orders like crazy. Donald Trump didn't give a shit if his executive orders got overturned. He put them in. He made it a culture issue. In fact, arguably, if it got overturned, that's even better for him because then it created a culture war issue. He created a culture war issue by uh, banning trans people from the military, by doing a, uh, by attempting to imp to put in a Muslim ban, both of which got overturned, and it didn't matter because his cult made it a culture war issue. And I'm not saying that Biden needs to do the exact same thing, but that's who he's contending with. He's contending with a guy who plays dirty. Donald Trump got to stack the Supreme Court with a bunch of deranged anti-abortion Christian nationalist judges, okay? Joe Biden has sat around twiddling his thumbs and saying, Congress, you better fix our rights. And the Congress goes, the Democrats go, we'll do it. And the Republicans go, fuck you. Thank you. My predecessor came to office determined to see Roe v. Wade overturned. He's the reason it was overturned, and he brags about it. Look at the chaos that has resulted. Joining us tonight is Kate Cox, the wife and mother from Dallas. She's become pregnant again and had a fetus of a fatal condition. Her doctor told Kate that her own life and her ability to have children in the future were at risk if she didn't act. Because Texas law banned her ability to act, Kate and her husband had to leave the state to get what she needed. What her family got through should have never happened as well, but it's happening in too many others. There are state laws banning the freedom to choose, criminalizing doctors, forcing survivors of rape and incest to leave their states to get the treatment they need. Many of you in this chamber and my predecessor are promising to pass a national ban on reproductive freedom. My God, what freedom else would you take away? Look. It's a decision to overturn Roe v. Wade. The Supreme Court majority wrote the following. And with all due respect, justices, women are not without electoral, electoral power. Uh, excuse me, electoral or political power. You're about to realize just how much you get right out. Oh, he fumbled at the worst time. Ooh. That is such a terrible point to fumble. He was winding up for a strong statement and he goofed. He was that close. And now it just comes off as bad. Clearly. Clearly. Those bragging about overturning Roe v. Wade have no clue about the power of women. But they found out when reproductive freedom was on the ballot, we won in 2022 and 2020, and we'll win again in 2024. <laughs> if you, if you, the American people, Send me a Congress that supports the right to choose. I promise you, I'll restore Roe v. Wade as the law of the land again. No, dude, you got to go further than Roe v. Wade. You have to go significantly further than Roe v. Wade. Roe v. Wade was, was a... The problem with Roe v. Wade is that it was purely on uh, that it was purely on privacy. It wasn't actually the right reproductive freedom. It was a privacy issue. And by... by sort of secondhand as a side effect that allowed for abortions to be legal because you have a privacy right. What they need to do is, th this is such an absurd, and this is a perfect example. This is a perfect example of where the Democrats just suck completely and where Joe Biden personally just sucks completely. He's like, I believe that we need to, if we get full control of Congress, I'll get you a milk toast version of what you used to have. What a stupid position. 
Who is motivated by this? You know, there's that joke that everybody makes at Kamala's expense where it's like, I believe that we should give a $10,000 tax break to people making between twenty-five dollars and $35,000 in their small business in a qualified neighborhood in the suburbs of major American cities. You know that fucking joke? The one where it's just like 900 qualifications on a thing and you go, uh, 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 do I even qualify? That's what this shit comes off as. When Joe Biden says, y if you give me the power that I definitely didn't already have, I'll give you a basically what you had before, kind of. It, they need to, they should, he should have said, if I get a Congress that is willing to think rationally about American freedom, Women deserve to be free. This is America. We live about, for liberty and freedom. And if you get me a rational Congress, if you vote for people who support freedom for women, I will make sure that women have reproductive freedom in this country. I will sign that law. And it'll be better than Roe v. Wade. That's what he should be saying. But you want to know why he doesn't? Because there's a part of his brain that still wants to appease the Republicans. The Republicans who did this. The Republicans who are, he just said, were cheering about it. The Democrats are so fucking lost. Oh, God, it's so bad. It's so bad. <laughs> Folks, America cannot go back. I'm here to, tonight to show what I believe is the way forward, because I know how far we come. What a thing to follow up what he just said. America can't go back. Literally the line after he promises that he'll bring America back to Roe v. Wade. Holy God. What a terrible line to follow up with. Who wrote this speech? Oh my God. He needs to fire his speechwriter. Four years ago next week, before I came to office, the country was hit by the worst pandemic and the worst economic crisis in a century. Remember the fear? record losses. Remember the spikes in crime and the murder rate, raging virus that took more than one million American lives of loved ones, millions left behind. A mental health crisis of isolation and loneliness. A president, my predecessor, failed the most basic presidential duty that he owes to American people, the duty to care. I think that's unforgivable. I came to office determined to get us through one of the toughest periods in the nation's history. We have. It doesn't make new, but in a news in a thousand cities and towns, the American people are writing the greatest comeback story never told. <laughs> so let's tell the story here. Tell it here and now. America's comeback is building the future of American possibilities. Building an economy from the middle out and the bottom up, not the top down. Investing in all America, in all Americans, to make every sure everyone has a fair shot. And we leave no one, no one behind. The pandemic no longer controls our lives. The vaccine that saved us from COVID are now being used to beat cancer, turning setback into comeback. That's what America does. That's what America does. Folks. Hey, he really won over those. Hey, look at that. He really won over those Republicans with uh, that comparison to Reagan. He really won over that Republican, the, those Republicans by saying, uh, yeah, you know, vote your conscience, guys, and uh, make sure, you know, on all, if you vote your conscience, I'll bring Roe v. Wade back, the thing that you guys destroyed. It's working. Oh, it's working. He's got all those Republicans. All of them. Look at them. <clears throat> Folks. I inherited economies on the brink. Now our economy is literally the envy of the world. 15 million new jobs in just three years. A record. A record. <laughs> Unemployment. 
at 50-year lows. A record 16 million Americans are starting small businesses, and each one is a literal act of hope. With historic job growth and small business growth for Black and Hispanics and Asian Americans, 800,000 new manufacturing jobs. Act of hope. With historic job growth and small business growth for Black and Hispanics and Asian Americans. Eight hundred thousand new manufacturing jobs in America and counting. Where is it written we can't be the manufacturing capital of the world? We are, we will. More people have health insurance today. More people have health insurance today than ever before. The racial wealth gap is as small as it's been in 20 years. Wages keep going up, inflation keeps coming down. Inflation has dropped from 9% to 3%, the lowest in the world, and tending lower. The landing is and will be soft. And now, instead of importing, importing foreign products and exporting American jobs, we're exporting American products and creating American jobs. Right here in America, where they belong. And it takes time, but the American people are beginning to feel it. Consumer studies show consumer confidence is soaring. Buy America has been the law of the land since the 1930s. Pass it in. Yeah, I don't know what he's talking about with health care. I don't feel like the health care situation has gotten better at all in America. Um, uh, as, as people in chat have brought up, uh, tons and tons of people have been kicked off of Medicaid. And additionally... Um, like, oh God, there's been basically no progress made to, Im to improve healthcare in America in any real way in the entire time he's been in office. Remember that Joe Biden, people were looking at Joe Biden because he was the vice president when Obama did Obamacare. Now, Obamacare made Republicans very angry, but Obamacare was considered fairly popular um, with a lot of people, especially because Obamacare brought reforms that got rid of pre-existing conditions, eliminated that as a legal concept whatsoever, which is a really big deal here in America. And he did nothing like that. So I don't know. I don't know what he's talking about, trying to boast about health care. Um, I think it's good that he uh, that he, you know, basically said that Trump dropped the ball on on covid. Uh, it's a strong argument for him, although I also think that he dropped the ball on COVID as well. Um, uh, Biden not only, I mean, keep in mind that one of people's earliest memories of Joe Biden is the uh, lying about how much money they were going to get from the pandemic, uh, the pandemic stimulus. That was one of the first controversies. That's fresh in a lot of people's minds. So when they hear him say that, you know, oh, Trump fucked up. Uh, they, he fucked up COVID, but I didn't. And then they go, well, Trump didn't lie about how much money he was going to give me. And you did a lot of people. That's like a thing that a lot of people bring up. So, yeah, I don't know. Um, I wouldn't say that Biden dropped the ball on COVID more than Trump did. Trump literally, like, I think that Trump, like Trump has blood on his hands in a very real way. Uh, Joe Biden didn't do a good job, but at least they kind of took it seriously to some degree. There was, you know, uh, a promotion of, of vaccines and promotion of masking, and they stopped too early and they didn't, uh, they ultimately caved to the demands of corporate America. But Donald Trump was, was using the pulpit of the White House to actively, um, to actively, uh, you know, promote, um, uh, uh, anti-masking to, to, to downplay, uh, 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 the need to get vaccinated. He was constantly photographed deliberately not wearing masks. He talked about, uh, sunlight therapy. There was the actions of Donald Trump likely got hundreds of thousands of people killed a number, which we can never fully know because it's hard to, to gauge exactly how far 
uh, uh, you know, his approach to COVID reached, his denialism, his constantly pivoting to try and blame China instead of actually take precautions against the illness, his constant, him and his party's constant opposition to basic safety procedures. It's pretty bad. Um, so, yeah, I think that he's good to hit Trump for that, but I don't know that it was, I don't know that it's going to do that well with his voter base. Let's continue. Administrations, including my pre predecessor, including some Democrats as well in the past, failed to buy American. Not anymore. On my watch, federal projects that you fund, like helping build American roads, bridges, and highways, will be made with American products and built by American workers. Okay, he's been talking about the Biden infrastructure plans since the beginning of his uh, time in office and nobody's really seen it. Nobody can feel that thing. And what everybody does remember is all of the infrastructure bills that failed and that they dropped. So uh, once again, I think this is a pretty fucking weak uh, point that a lot of people, even, li even like milquetoast Dems are not gonna find this particularly motivating. Uh, first of all, infrastructure is a pretty difficult thing to sell to people because most people don't actually feel the results of improved infrastructure if you're not showing it to them. The reason why FDR was able to run on infrastructure is because everybody could feel that. They were not they were churning out uh, uh, every type of coverage you possibly could of every change they made. National parks and highways and sewer systems and new parks and all this stuff was constantly being pushed. They were talking about it constantly. That has not happened for Biden. When was the last time you saw like the Democratic Party celebrating some major uh, infrastructure win? They haven't. And most people haven't felt it either. And there's not like they, he can, it's not like he did some giant product like a uh, project like the, uh, you know, the American highway system. There's nothing like that. So he's just kind of deferring to a vague sense. And I don't know if you know this, but Americans across the political board, they kind of hate American infrastructure. In fact, the reputation of American infrastructure is that it's garbage. Everybody complains about the potholes in their road, the lack of public transit, the, the lack of safety, how everything's fucking falling apart. All the bridges are getting shut down constantly. Uh, roads are shut down constantly. Americans hate infrastructure. So him deferring and saying, I did that is a bad move because he hasn't set it up. He hasn't set himself up to make that play. Now, if he had a hundred different things that he could list that he did, and they had also been churning out, you know, photographs and news stories and interviews about that stuff, maybe that would sell, but this just doesn't. It just doesn't. Creating good paying American jobs. Oh, Jesus, what's happening in the audience? And thanks to our Chips and Science Act, the United States is investing more in research and development than ever before. During the pandemic, a shortage of semiconductors, chips, that drove up the price of everything from cell phones to automobiles. And by the way, we invented those chips right here in America. Well, instead of having to import them, instead of we, private companies are now investing billions of dollars to build new chip factories here in America, creating tens of thousands of jobs. Many of those jobs paying $100,000 a year and don't require a college degree. <laughs> In fact... Okay, look, you want to see a Giga Chad move? Look at this guy over here on his cell phone. Front row, okay? Front fucking row of the, of the State of the Union on his goddamn telephone. That, that takes some goddamn balls, okay? That's a fucking... <laughs> Invited to the presidential State of the Union, sitting in the front row, don't care. In fact, my policies have attracted $650 billion in private sector investment, in clean energy, advanced manufacturing, creating tens of thousands of jobs here in America. Oh my God. <clears throat> and 
Thanks. And thanks to our bipartisan infrastructure law, 46,000 new projects have been announced all across your communities. And by the way, I noticed some of you have strongly voted. <laughs> what? This cameraman? Who did this? Why did they fire the camera directly into the face of Pete Buttigieg? He's, li he's literally doing the stare. <laughs> oh my God. against it or they're cheering on that money coming in. I like it. I'm with you. I'm with you. And if any of you don't want that money in your district, just let me know. Modernize our roads and bridges, ports and airports, public transit systems. Removing po poisonous lead pipes so every child can drink clean water without risk of brain damage. <clears throat> providing affordable, affordable high-speed internet for every American, no matter where you live, urban, suburban, or rural communities, in red states and blue states. Record investments in tribal communities because of my investment in family farms. <clears throat> because my investment in family farms led by my Secretary of Agriculture who knows more about this than anybody I know. We're better able to stay in the family for the, those farms for the, and their children and grandchildren won't have to leave. Oh, dude. Holy shit. This is a mess. Oh, my. Oh, my God. That was a mess. What, what was he trying to say there? Leave home to make a living. They need to have the they need to have the the uh, the guy who has the uh, the amphetamine injection gun. They need to have him go whoop so he gets whoa and wakes up, you know? Maybe there's a guy under the podium with like a little a little gun that goes and it's like a stim, you know, it's like a stim pack from a video game. It's transformative. The great comeback story is Belvedere, Illinois home to an auto plant for nearly 60 years. Before I came to office, the plant was on its way to shutting down. Thousands of workers feared for their livelihoods. Hope was fading. Then I was elected to office and we raised the Belvedere repeatedly with auto companies knowing unions would make all the difference. The UAW worked like hell to keep the plant open and get these jobs back and together we succeeded. Instead of auto factories shutting down, Auto factories reopening, a new state-of-the-art battery factory is being built to power those cars there at the same. <laughs> folks. The folks of Belvedere, I say, instead of your town being left behind, your community is moving forward again. Because instead of watching auto job, jobs in the future go overseas, 4,000 union jobs with higher wages are building the future in Belvedere right here in America. Well, everyone, you know what you can do right here in America right now? If you're enjoying this coverage, if you're laughing and having a good time, if you're getting angry with me and enjoying my passionate speech, that's like 20 times more energetic than the President of the United States, make sure that you press subscribe down below and the like button. Whether you're watching live or are one of our glorious citizens in the future video watching, press that button right now. Subscribe and like those buttons. There's actually two of them. That's how free and liberty we are. We're so amazing and, and uh, uh, you can be an American citizen on a private family farm and a whoa, Earth Rider. Uh, 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 anyways.
Here tonight is UAW President Sean Fain, a great friend and a great labor leader. Sean, where are you? Stand up. And, and Dawn, and Dawn Sim. This is a pretty good move. I, I don't think I have anything negative to say about this. Um, one of the things that was very popularly liked among his own voter base was his willingness to actually show up at a major strike um, and uh, highlighting the guy who was sort of the, the leadership face of that at your State of the Union is a good move. Uh, that's going to play well with Democrats. It's going to piss off Republicans, but literally, who cares? The Republicans who are going to get mad about that are the biggest, are literally just corporate simps and literal billionaires themselves. So doesn't really matter. You're winning numbers by shouting out union leaders. Uh, unions have lots of membership. They tend to be, you know, members of unions tend to be very in tune with the issues of unions. Playing to the strength of unions is a good play for Biden. Just a good play. I think this is one of the best moves that he's made so far. The third generation worker, UAW worker at Belvedere. Sean, I was proud to be the first president to stand on the picket line. And today, Dawn has a good job in her hometown, providing stability for her family and pride and dignity as well. Showing once again, Wall Street didn't build America. They're not bad guys. They didn't build it, though. The middle class built the country, and unions built the middle class. I say to the American people, when America gets knocked down, we get back up. We keep going. That's America. That's you, the American people. It's because of you America's coming back. It's because of you our future is brighter. It's because of you that tonight we can proudly say the state of our union is strong and getting stronger. Tonight, I want to talk about the future. I'm cringing. I am cringing. That is... Look, I'm not saying Republicans invented the term four more years, given that, I mean, it's been forever that presidential terms are four years long. But in recent memory, the four more years thing is a Republican pro-Trump chant. That is where it was. This is literally the liberals doing like a clap back, snap, snap, like, oh, we didn't. That's right. We're saying four more years now. Oh, yeah. Oh, God, it's fucking cringe. Oh, it's so goddamn cringe. Future of possibilities that we can build together. A future where the days of trickle down economics are over. And the wealthy and the biggest corporations no longer get the, all the tax breaks. And by the way, I understand corporations. I come from a state that has more corporations invested than every one of your states in the state of the United States combined. And I represented for 36 years. I'm not anti-corporation, but I grew up. Horrible, horrible thing to say. Just terrible thing to say right here. He doesn't. There's no need to go out of the... I mean, of course, I believe this is wh where he's showing what he actually does believe, that he does support corporations. I don't know if you know this, but corporations are not fucking popular in America. They're not popular with anyone other than literal corporate, like direct corporate employees, okay? Even right-wingers don't... Pr they pretend they don't like corporations, okay? Even though they do a lot to basically do it all the time, the... That is like the most anti-populist -popula thing you could possibly do right now. The, the way to, to like damage your appeal with the most people possible is to say, you know, I'm from the place that has the most corporations ever. Delaware, a place notorious for, for helping corporations 
uh, uh, get exactly what they want, a place that's notorious for being ruled by corporations, then saying, I'm not against corporations. Why? Just don't say anything. Again, the ball dropping with Joe Biden is just constant. This guy is fumbling constantly. Terrible. We live in the Amazon era. We live in the post-Bernie era. You are not going to win anyone over by saying you like corporations. Well, you might win corporations over, but that's going to hurt your electoral chances. Because as it turns out, big surprise, but corporations don't actually vote. When you're going into an election, you need to be appealing to the people that vote. Oh my God, whatever, let's go. In a home where trickle-down economics didn't put much on my dad's kitchen table. That's why I determined to turn things around so middle class does well. When they do well, the poor of a way up and the wealthy still do very well. We all do well. And there's more to do to make sure you're feeling the benefits of all we're doing. Americans pay more for prescription drugs than anywhere in the world. It's wrong, and I'm ending it. For the law that I proposed and signed, not one of you Republican buddies worked, voted for it. We finally beat Big Pharma. Instead of paying $400 a month or thereabouts for insulin with diabetes, and it only costs 10 bucks to make, they only get paid 35 a month now and still make healthy profit. And I want to. Now that's a, that's a good play. That's a good play. Unironically, this is just a good tactic. Obviously, he's over, you know, he's kind of overselling his own thing. And there are much bigger questions uh, about insulin being like, well, now it only costs 35 a month, a, a necessary medication for people to live. And they're boasting about how you only have to pay $35 a month for it, which is quite a lot of goddamn money. But uh, all that aside, you know, well, I'll put aside my leftism, my actual care for people who have diabetes and need a, a life-saving medication every month that the government could easily, completely subsidize. Put that aside for a minute. This is just a good play. It is true that under the Republicans and the ideal Republican system, they would, they would let that cost go as high as they possibly could. It is true that the Republicans didn't get behind this change, and it is true that it's a big improvement, and it's largely the Dems that did that. So this is just a good one to do. This is just a very good point, And I think it's going to appeal to a lot of people. It's a tangible, actual thing that people out there have felt and know. Most people know somebody who uh, in their family who has diabetes. Most people know that those people have a really hard time financially. Most people will be able to hear this and go, actually, that's pretty goddamn good. I can't believe the Republicans voted, voted against that. Pretty good move. Good play. But what to do next? I want to cap the cost of insulin at $35 a month for every American in Egypt. Everyone. For years, people have talked about it, but finally we got it done and gave Medicare the power to negotiate lower prices on prescription drugs, just like the VA is able to do for veterans. That's not just saving seniors money. It's saving taxpayers money. We cut the federal deficit by $160 billion. Because Medicare will no longer have to pay those exorbitant prices to Big Pharma. This year, Medicare is negotiating lower prices for some of the costliest drugs on the market to treat everything from heart disease to arthritis. It's now time to go further and give Medicare the power to negotiate lower prices for 500 different drugs over the next decade. They're making a lot of money, guys. And they'll still be extremely profitable. They'll not only save lives, it will save taxpayers another $200 billion. Starting next year, the same law caps total prescription drug costs for seniors on Medicare at $2,000 a year. 
even for expensive cancer drugs that cost ten, twelve, fifteen thousand dollars. I want a cap prescription drug cost of two thousand dollars a year for everyone. Yeah. Folks. I'm weak. Weak. That's weak. And that's a weak follow up. Amer Americans want Americans. Th this is that thing again. This is the exact thing I was talking about before with the uh, yeah, you can get a 10 percent discount on on certain tax fees that you have to do if you own a small business in a small qualifying suburb. Yeah, we want to cap your prescription drug costs for seniors at two thousand dollars a year. The fact that there are cancer drugs that cost $15,000 a year at all is a heinous, disgusting state of affairs. The fact that there are com for profit companies charging people $15,000 for ne medically necessary. This is the type of thing that, uh, that you do not have to be a politician. You do not have to be politically astute to know that these things are wrong, okay? Like, there, in in Canterbury Tales, the 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 old English poem, there is an entire section devoted to decrying the sinful nature of a pharmacist who charges people money for medicine that they need to live, okay? Uh, a chemist, okay? Let's just, you don't exactly have this, you know, this was a stories consumed by peasants in the Middle Ages, okay? You don't exactly have to be, uh, you know, a politically activated person to go, wait, it's kind of messed up that for-profit megacorporations char are charging people $15,000 a year for cancer treatment. There seems like there's something wrong with that. You don't even have to be a universal healthcare person to, to, to recognize that nobody is going to hear, yeah, I want to cap your, medic, your medical prescription costs at $2,000 a year. You know? That's not, a, that's not exactly an exciting thing to get energized about. Especially, especially when there are objectively so many Americans who are in support of a universal health care program. That Americans can talk to people from other countries. That Americans talk to their friends in Canada and their friends in Canada go, yeah, when I, ha when I need a prescription drug, I just go pick it up and I don't got to pay anything. I'm going to get in trouble for saying that, but if you want to get an Air Force One and fly to Toronto, Berlin, Moscow, I mean, excuse me, and it, well, even Moscow, probably. <laughs> and bring your prescription with you, and I promise you, I'll get it for you for 40% the cost you're paying now. Same company. <laughs> that was a bungle. That was a, that is a really bad bungle. Oh, that is a terrible bungle. Dude! That was a, whoo, what a moment. Oh, 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 Earth Rider. Jesus Christ. Same drug, same place. Folks, the Affordable Care Act, the old Obamacare, is, is still a very big deal. <laughs> Over 100 million of you can no longer be denied health insurance because of pre-existing condition. Okay, good point. Except, what did you do? That was Obamacare. It's called Obamacare. Where's Joe Care? There isn't Joe Care. Well, my predecessor, and many in this chamber, want to take this prescription drug away by repealing the Affordable Care Act. I'm not going to let that happen. We stopped you 50 times before and we'll stop you again. In fact, I'm not only protecting it, I'm expanding it. The, we, the enacted tax credits of $800 per person per year reduce health care costs. Oh, for wow. Oh, God. This is one of the hardest things to watch here. Okay, ready? 
Watch this. Watch Kamala's face. It. They, we, they enacted tax credits of $800 per person per year. Do you see Kamala's face there? The look of fear that comes across Kamala's face every time he starts bumbling. Every time he starts stumbling. I've watched it happen multiple times now. She just, she, there's like a, there's like a distinct change in her expression. That's like, oh God, please recover. Please recover. Please don't do it again. Reduce health care costs for millions of working families. That tax credit expires next year. I want to make that savings permanent. <laughs> to state the obvious, women are more than half our population. But research on women's health has always been underfunded. That's why we're launching the first ever White House initiative on women's health research, led by Jill, doing an incredible job as First Lady. To, pa to pass my plan for $12 billion to transfer women's health research and benefit millions of lives all across America. <clears throat> I know the cost of housing is so important to you. If inflation keeps coming down, mortgage rates will come down as well. And the Fed acknowledges that. But I'm not waiting. I want to provide an annual tax credit that will give Americans $400 a month for the next two years as mortgage rates come down to put toward their mortgages when they buy their first home or trade up for a little more space. Just for two years. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. I don't know. Where is Joe? Has Joe been paying attention to the fact that fucking nobody has a house anymore? Uh, the, the youth vote, and not even just the youth vote, but the slightly younger vote has been dreadfully struggling to get anything but renting in this country. Everyone has to rent. What, how is this going to appeal to anybody except for people who are already well-established, which are a minority of the vote? Oh, God. Out, out of touch. That's what we call that. That's out of touch. And my administration is also eliminating title insurance on federally backed mortgages. When you refinance your home, you can save $1,000 or more as a consequence. For millions of renters, we're cracking down on big landlords who use antitrust law, using antitrust, who break antitrust laws by price fixing and driving up rents. We've cut red tape so builders can get federally financing, which is already helping build a record 1.7 million new house, housing units nationwide. Now passed. Now pass and build and renovate two million affordable homes and bring those rents down. Um, okay, we'll see. I mean, I guess it's good that he's addressing rent, uh, that, that rent is out of control in the United States and that rent is eating up more and more and more of Americans' income. But I'm not going to lie, this is shockingly vague in comparison to uh, what he was just talking about with regard to homeowners. You know, I got this. I'm going to give you $1,000. Uh, I'm going to crack down on uh, big renters who, you know, maybe maybe break antitrust laws. It's not just it's not just antitrust issues. There's, it's not just trust trust busting that's going on in the housing industry. It's the fact that rent is so normalized that wages are so messed up and that rent is generally going up you don't have to you don't have to be now it is true that mega conglomerates are a massive problem but in america in the modern landscape you don't have to be a mega conglomerate to use a tool uh, uh to use a tool like a zillow or an apartments.com that is coordinating and influencing uh, uh, rent rates. You can go search that and go, oh, yeah, well, okay, they're raising their rent. I'm going to raise my rent. And people get moved by these algorithms into continually raising the rent. And there's nothing that, um, that renters can do about it because renters don't have any goddamn rights. 
And that's the thing that he should be talking about. He should be talking about uh, empowering tenants' rights. He should be talking about how we actually address the problems uh, that, that, re that, that landlords, the power that landlords have over renters. But, you know, this is lip service. Obviously, he's not going to go into that, despite the fact that I'll point out most people are renting. Most people who are going to be considering voting for Joe Biden are not homeowners and they're currently renting. And what they hear is, yeah, maybe I'm going to build new units uh, or something somewhere in America. No idea if it'll affect you. I don't have anything specific to give you to take home. We're going to we're, we're telling you that we're going to encourage private companies to build more housing. How we're going to do that? Don't know. High Progressive says he should have made a Mao Zedong reference. Yes. So just like he did. A <laughs> yes. Just like he did a. Uh, he just did the uh, the goddamn uh, uh, <laughs> Moscow reference a few minutes ago. He should have been like. He should have been like. You can call me Beijing Biden with how I'm going to be going after those apartment owners. Those landlords. You better get scared. Yeah, Chairman Joe, call me Chairman Joe, because I'm going to fucking kill you. <laughs> to remain the strongest economy in the world, we need to have the best education system in the world. And I, like I suspect all of you, want to give a child, every child, a good start by providing access to preschool for three and four years old. You know... I think I pointed out last year. I think I pointed out last year that children coming from broken homes where there's no books and not read to, not spoken to very often, start school, kindergarten or first grade, hearing having heard a million fewer words spoken. Well, studies show the children who go to preschool are nearly 50% more likely to finish high school, go on to earn a two and four year degree, no matter what their background is. I met a year and a half ago with the leaders of the business roundtable. They were mad that I, they were angry. I said, well, they were d discussing why I wanted to spend money on education. I pointed out to them as vice president, I met with over eight, I think it was 182 of those folks. Don't hold me the exact number. And uh, I asked them what they need most, the CEOs. And you've had the same experience on both sides now. They say a better educated workforce, right? So I looked at them and I say, I come from Delaware. DuPont used to be the eighth largest corporation in the world. And every new enter enterprise they bought, they educated the workforce to that enterprise. But none of you do that anymore. Why are you angry with me? Hell of a, hell of a move to praise DuPont. You know, chemical, chemical explosions, DuPont. Uh, poisoning the rivers, DuPont. DuPont, you mean one of the most infamous polluters on the planet, one of the most uh, infamous corporations on the entire goddamn planet for corporate workplace disasters and environmental disasters. That's like standing up here and praising fucking BP. Providing you the opportunity for the best educated workforce in the world. And they all looked at me and said, I think you're right. I want to expand high quality tutoring and summer learning to see that every child learns to read by third grade. I'm also connecting local businesses and high schools so students get hands-on experience and a path to good paying job, whether or not they go to college. And I want to make sure the college is more affordable. <laughs> First and first says, yeah, he's just shouting out his tier four subscribers. Oh my God. 
<laughs> Speaking of which, tier three subscriber Discordant Vol, or maybe D Dupont Vol. Thank you very much for supporting the show. Means the world to me. If Joe Biden can do it, I can do it. Well, let's continue increasing the Pell Grants to working and middle class families and increase record investments in HBCU and minority serving institutions, including Hispanic institutions. And I was told I couldn't universally just change the way in which we did, dealt, dealt with student loans. I fixed two student loan programs that already existed to reduce the burden of student debt for nearly four million Americans, including nurses, firefighters. Hold on, I gotta take a minute. There's a LH Fruit in, in YouTube chat. I don't, who are you talking to? Are you, try, are you sending, are you trying to talk to, to chat messages at me? Because I don't know, uh, I don't know why, like why you feel the need to, uh, uh, to, to, to gargle on fucking Grandpa Joe's balls to the point that they're making dents in your chin. But uh, if you're making a, if you're, if you're saying that I'm fucking lying right now, I'm going to have to say maybe you should come up for air is all I'm going to say. Maybe it's time. Maybe it's time for some air. And others in public service. Like Keenan Jones. You're spreading misinformation. It is what it is. What misinformation have I spread? Right now. Tell me it. Tell me what misinformation I've spread. If you can. Like, you know, if you can around the giant wet noodle in your mouth. Public educator from Minnesota. Who's here with us tonight? Keenan, where are you? Keenan, thank you. He's educated hundreds of students so they can go to college. Now he's able to help after debt forgiveness get his own daughter to college. And folks, look. Such relief is good for the economy. Oh, you're being too mean to the President of the United States. You said you didn't think he was promising big enough. Oh, this is misinformation, a word that I was, the word that I learned on Twitter from my liberal friends. Shut the fuck up. Shut the fuck up. Absolutely shut the fuck up. Your incessant need to fucking throw yourself in front of a goddamn imaginary bullet for Joe Biden is an embarrassment. If you have, if you think I'm spreading a goddamn uh, piece of misinformation, fucking hit me with it. But I don't think you got it. I think what you don't like is you don't like my opinions. And you're going to come up with any fucking thing that you can invent so that you can go, Oh, no, stop being mean to, to my Uncle Joe. Shut up. Shut the fuck up. Shut the fuck up. Joe Biden's job is to appeal to his goddamn voters, of which I am one. Joe Biden has an entire goddamn administration of experts, of people who he claims are supposed to help him goddamn leave, okay? And this guy has barely, barely managed to keep it together, together for four years in the face of what he in his own goddamn words claims is the biggest threat to democracy. And if the best that these motherfuckers can come up with to beat Donald Trump is, uh, yeah, if you're, uh, you know, if you're a first time home buyer, I'll give you a $400 discount spread across your first 15 mortgage payments. Shut the fuck up. LH Fruit said, additionally, you said he wasn't doing anything about renting prices. What did he say he was doing about renting prices? And in fact, I didn't say that. I said that antitrust busting, which is what he claimed he was doing, is or, or trust busting isn't the only thing that matters. And also that it was vague as fuck saying, I'm gonna do trust busting means nothing. When you just spent the last 10 minutes saying how you're gonna give a $50 discount to every person who considers buying a home. You have to, he, Joe Biden is out of touch. He's not speaking to the people he needs to vote for him. 
Renters are a lot of people who vote for Democrats, okay? Working people who, who don't who, who, who don't know what the hell it's going to help to hear Joe Biden vaguely say that he's going to do trust busting. Oh, what he claimed he was doing? Did you actually look into this or assume that he isn't doing anything? He's trying to sell himself as the president right now. I'm taking his claims and talking about them. Since when is it is it fucking my job to sit here and be as favorable to Joe Biden as possible when he's trying to sell himself to the American electorate and his promises are vague and boring? What do you have? You're sitting here fucking throwing bullshit from chat like a fucking idiot. And where's your thing? Give me an example then. Oh, if Joe Biden is doing such a good job for renters, show me a link. Give me something. You're sitting here going, you don't, you don't have an example of what he is or isn't doing when you're reacting to his speech. You should be able to have one then. Oh, or maybe you're too busy fucking deep polishing the fucking mushroom of this guy's fucking cockhead. Jesus fucking Christ, you people. Pathetic. Let's see it. You Surely you should have an example. I can't fit the entire policy description on chat. Ladies and gentlemen, we got him. Full of shit. You didn't have one thing. You're sitting here fucking preaching from chat. And you don't even have one example of... And you, you say I'm spreading misinformation. Because I disagree with Joe Biden and said his promises were vague. And you don't even have one thing. You don't even have... Yo, oh, I couldn't copy-paste his entire website description. Fuck off. Fuck off. Holy shit, fuck off. Holy God. Dude, the Biden bots are so bad. What is wrong with this? What... What? Who? Where do you think you are? All right, everybody. Sorry, I'm sorry. I really lost my cool there, everybody. It's just, you know, these Democrat demons. Sometimes I'm just sitting here and the goblins start crawling out and the Hillary Clintons are all over the place and I see Joe Biden and Hillary Clinton crawling all over my chat. And I just, something, something comes over me. And I'm sorry, I apologize, I lost my cool. I shouldn't do that. Fine, how about you type 255 on policy while someone's setting off three more claims? I've been sitting here ranting about uh, and responding to you for like five minutes now, and you couldn't even give me a link to a website that shows that Joe Biden is, that, that, even, gives, that even gives the smell, the sniff, the, the vague essence that, that me saying I don't think Joe Biden is doing enough for renters is somehow misinformation. You rolled up with a big ass claim and you've got fucking nothing. And the only reason I'm calling you out is because I've seen you posting fucking paragraphs in the chat on YouTube for like an hour or two hours now. Paragraph after paragraph saying, oh, you're better than this. You're spreading misinformation. Fucking put up or shut the fuck up. Straight up. The fact that you feel the need to defend Joe Biden to that degree from what I, what, from my, look, I'm not even being a bad faith lefty right now, okay? Half of this speech time I have dedicated to giving Joe Biden, A, I think that was a good message for his audience. If I wanted to review this purely from a lefty angle, all of this shit would be a load of crock. This guy is lying to your face. He has no obligation to deliver on any of this. He's trying to sell you so that you'll vote for him so that he can rule over you. That's the real take of all of this. That's the real hot take, okay? 
So you're getting offended and feel the need to throw yourself on the goddamn floor and lick for Joe Biden. And I'm not even going as hard as I could. I haven't even, I haven't even activated a fraction of my goddamn power. You haven't even seen my abilities yet. I'm just getting started. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Okay, so here's what they say. I don't know. I don't care about Joe Biden. I don't know shit about him. I care about getting this stuff right when claiming people aren't doing anything. Apparently, you need to go back to school on getting things right because your inability to even respond on the fly after accusing me of doing misinformation for stating my opinion in response to Joe Biden's sales pitch for himself, you failed to even con to even have on hand, despite getting all up on your fucking high horse. You didn't even have a single fucking example, and you still don't have a single example. Maybe you gotta. Maybe it's time to take advantage of that Biden program. That one. That what did he say? He said if you're a if you, if you're a student in a disadvantaged uh, township. Uh, you know, below a certain latitude line, you can get a $25 coupon for Wendy's. If you apply to college, maybe you should do that. Maybe you should take advantage of that. Because folks are now able to buy a home, start a business, start a family. While we're at it, I want the public school teachers a raise. You haven't actually illustrated what claim I made that was supposedly wrong. My claim was that I don't think Joe Biden is doing enough to appeal to renters in this goddamn speech. That's what my claim was. You're having a hissy fit because you're a, a weeping liberal bitch who can't handle the idea that maybe Joe Biden You've been salty since the beginning of this entire fucking segment. And yeah, I'm taking time out of it to roast because you've been filling the fucking chat for all my goddamn viewers. You've been making them read your fucking putrid blubbering for two goddamn hours. Walls of text whining because I started this out by criticizing Biden. It's very visible to me and everybody else exactly what you're pissed about. You're mad because you have a knee-jerk reaction and a need to feel fucking superior, which is the, you know, that is the calling of the liberal. <sighs> All right. All right. Now, we re-rail. Everyone, it's time. We must re-rail. I shall not fear. Fear is the mind killer. Fear, wait, that's not the right one. That's the, the fear one, hold on. I shall not derail. Derailing is the mind killer, the little death that brings total obliteration. There we go. We're back on the rails. We are re-railed. We are in our lane. Whew. Let's go. Whew. The first couple of years, we cut the deficit. Now, let me speak to the question of fundamental fairness for all Americans. I've been delivering real results in fiscally responsible ways. We've already cut the federal deficit. We've already cut the federal deficit over a trillion dollars. I signed the bipartisan deal to cut another trillion dollars in the next decade. It's my goal to cut the federal deficit another three trillion by making big corporations and very wealthy finally beginning to pay their fair share. Look. I'm a capitalist. If you want to make or can make a million or millions of bucks, that's great. Just pay <laughs> your fair share in tax. He's spitting. He got that Biden flow. Listen to that shit. Look. 
I'm a capitalist. If you want to make or can make a million or millions of bucks, that's great. You Just want to make him a make a can make a chameleon bucks. Incredible. Joe Biden fucking spitting bars. Pay your fair share in taxes. <laughs> a fair tax code is how we invest things to make this country great. Healthcare, education, defense, and so much more. But here's the deal. The last administration enacted a $2 trillion tax cut. Overwhelmingly benefit the top in 1%, the very wealthy and the biggest corporation. And exploded the federal deficit. They added more to the national debt than any presidential term in American history. Check the numbers. Folks at home, does anybody really think the tax code is fair? Do you really think the wealthy and big corporations need another $2 trillion tax break? No! I sure don't. I'm going to keep fighting like hell to make it fair. Under my plan, nobody earning less than $400,000 a year will pay additional penny in federal taxes. Nobody, not one penny. And they haven't yet. In fact, the child tax credit I passed during the pandemic cut taxes for millions of working families and cut child poverty in half. Restore that child tax credit. No child should go hungry in this country. The way to make the tax code fair is to make big corporations the very wealthy begin to pay their fair share. Remember in 2020, 55 of the biggest companies in America made $40 billion and paid zero in federal income tax. Zero. Not anymore. Thanks to the law I wrote and we signed, big companies have to pay a minimum of 15 percent. But that's still less than working people pay in federal taxes. It's time to raise. That's 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 so inc such an incredibly low amount of taxes. Oh, man. Just makes you realize what it would be. You know, we should all just become big corporations. I would, oh man, it would be amazing if I only had to pay 15%. You know how much I have to pay as a independent contractor, which is what you are when you're a YouTube channel, unless you make an LLC, which I might have to do at some point. Uh, you pay a lot, okay? You pay a, a goddamn lot. You know, we should all just, we should all just become gigantic multi-billion co corporations. That would solve all our problems corporate minimum tax to at least 21 percent. So every big corporation finally begins to pay their fair share. I also want to end tax breaks for big pharma, big oil, private checks, massive executive pay when it's only supposed to be a million, a million dollars that could be deducted. They can pay them 20 million if they want, but deduct a million. End it now. You know, there are 1,000 billionaires in America. You know what the average federal tax is for those billionaires? No. They're making great sacrifices, 8.2 percent. That's far less than the vast majority of Americans pay. No billionaire should pay a lower federal tax rate than a teacher, a sanitation worker, or a nurse. propose a minimum tax for billionaires at 25 percent, just 25 percent. You know what that would raise? That would raise $500 billion over the next 10 years. And imagine what that could do for America. An aggressive Imagine promise. a future with affordable child care. Millions of families can get they need to go to work to help grow the economy. Imagine a future with paid leave because no one should have to choose between working and taking care of their sick family member. Imagine, imagine the future of home care and elder care and people living with disabilities so they can stay in their homes and family caregivers can finally get the pay they deserve. Tonight, let's all agree once again to stand up for seniors. Many of my friends on the other side of aisle want to put Social Security on the chopping block. Okay, let's see it. 
I want to see Joe Biden get that 25% tax rate. I want to see it. Let's see it. Let's see Dems commit to that. That's a lot of talk. That's a lot of talk. Imagine a world that's good. Imagine good things. Now, is there a path to actually getting it? Guess we're going to find out. You want to know part of the problem with Joe Biden at this point is that nobody fucking believes him because he made a lot of these promises and people haven't seen a whole lot of it. People haven't seen him deliver on a whole lot of his promises. So he has a credibility problem. He can promise whatever the hell he wants, but people don't buy it. People aren't going to buy it from him when he does manage to actually promise something. I will say it's certainly better for his electoral options that he promises big. But Joe Biden has made himself a serious problem by not delivering on a lot of his promises. Yeah, remember when he promised about codifying Roe? That didn't happen, even when they had a full advantage. No president delivers on his promises? Yeah, obviously. The, no promise, no president does that. Because it's, it's because it's it's consent manufacturing. It is it is they make promises to you. They tell you they're going to do things. You vote for them. Then they say, "Well, you voted for me," and they don't actually have to. Your vote is stuck in stone. They got the power. They don't have any actual obligation. No one can do anything to them if they don't deliver on their promises. But you voted for them, and they're in power now. See, you voted for them. It's, it's just a big consent manufacturing process. Okay, I can't get mad at literal drooling idiots in chat anymore. We have to, we have to, I have to spend more time on this goddamn thing. We gotta get this Fine. done. If anyone here tries to cut Social Security, Medicare, or raise the retirement age, I will stop you. Oh yeah, true, good point, Danny. Danny says, remember when we were promised to have less, less fascism on the southern border and it was a big beat reason that people voted for Biden when Joe Biden spent a lot of time talking about how disgusting Trump's border policies are only for him to move forward capitulating to the worst actors in the border states? The working people, the working people who built this country pay more into Social Security than millionaires and billionaires do. It's not fair. We have two ways to go. Republicans can cut Social Security and give more tax breaks to the wealthy. I will, that's the proposal. Oh no, you guys don't want another $2 trillion tax cut? I kind of thought that's what your plan was. Well, that's good to hear. You, Sorry, you guys don't, I will. Republicans can cut Social Security and give more tax breaks to the wealthy. I will, that's the proposal. Oh no, you guys don't want another $2 trillion tax cut? I kind of thought that's what your plan was. Well, that's good to hear. You're not gonna cut another $2 trillion for the super wealth, that's good to hear. I'll protect and strengthen Social Security and make the wealthy. All right, fair play, Joe, that was a good one. Good job, bro. That was a good call. Not that it really matters in the end. Uh, these types of quips back and forth, there's nothing set in stone, but it's a good look. It's definitely a good look. For the people who made it 40 minutes into the State of the Union, I'm sure uh, it definitely makes the Republicans uh, look bad. And it also is at least one sort of public point against the Republicans. Uh, but it also falls into the hypocrisy camp so it doesn't have all that much power, but nonetheless, decent play. Good play, Joe. Pay their fair share. Look. Blablado says, will you review the Republican response because it was so bad? 
Um, I don't know. I don't know if I want to see the Republican response. I know what they're going to respond with. Derangement. We know where the state of the Republicans are right now. I don't know if we gain anything from, like, spending a lot of time looking at their responses. It's hilarious. It's awkward. All right, give me the link. All right, give me the link. Maybe we'll watch some of it. We have so much to do tonight, and it's already 8.30. Too many corporations raise prices to pad their profits, charging more and more for less and less. That's why it's cracking down on corporations that engage in price gouging and deceptive pricing, from food to health care to housing. In fact, the snack companies think you won't notice if they change the size of the bag and put a hell of a lot fewer, <laughs> same, same size bag, put fewer chips in it. No, I'm not joking. It's called shrinkflation. Pass Bobby <laughs> Casey's bill and stop this. So what? I really mean it. Okay, that might be the most relatable thing he said the entire time. This is a Grandpa Joe moment, and I'm here for it. Good job, Grandpa Joe. Tackle that chip chipflation. You know, it's the same hedgehog, but more air. They call it sonic inflation. You probably all saw that commercial on Snickers bars. You get you get charged the same amount, and you got about I don't know ten percent fewer Snickers in it. Look, I'm also getting rid of junk fees. Those hidden fees at the end of your bill that are there without your knowledge. My administration announced we're cutting credit card late fees from $32 to $8. Banks and credit card companies are allowed to charge what it costs them to, in, to instigate the, the, the collection. And that's more a hell of a lot, like $8 and 30-some dollars. They don't like it. The credit card companies don't like it. But I'm saving American families $20 billion a year with all the junk fees I'm eliminating. I feel like he should have put this stuff much earlier in. Like, I feel like this should have been, like, he should have done a best hits at the beginning of this speech, and this should have been one of them. Unironically, this is something that was very popular. Um... The fact that Joe Biden is paying attention to something like uh, predatory late fees and hidden fees is actually really good. Um, the hidden fees are really heinous. Okay, so here's one. Let me give you an example of just, a, just an off-the-cuff example of how bad uh, hidden fees are. So recently, um, so, okay, so the city of Seattle has passed a whole bunch of legislation to try and tackle the gross underpayment of delivery workers. Delivery workers, you know, people who work for DoorDash, Grubhub, blah, 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 all those different, you know, Uber Eats. They get, like, there's a lot of them. It's really, really, really big in big cities. There's a ton of people working these things and they don't get paid very well. In fact, it's, it's pretty egregious. And so Seattle, um, has passed some laws that basically say um, that are just like if you're a server at a restaurant where there's a minimum amount, a minimum wage that they must be paid um, that kicks in if they don't make enough with tips to surpass that minimum wage. So basically, um, these gigantic, highly profitable food delivery corporations um, that have very little overhead costs and basically are just facilitator apps, these app corporations actually have to grapple with the fact that they have created a disempowered workforce that is grossly underpaid and overworked. And if the, their workers are working and aren't getting making enough from doing that work, there's a minimum wage that's in place now. So a lot of these apps have started doing a new thing. And there is literally a fee that will be added and you can open it up. It's in the, uh, you have to actually like press a button. There'll be like a, a service fees thing. And then you can open it up on the app and see the extra fees. And if you're ordering food within the city of Seattle, it will say um, Seattle City, it's called like Seattle City uh, uh, 
wage fee, and it's just like a $6 fee that they add to every single delivery in the city now as a hidden fee. It is literally hidden behind an additional menu that they add to every one. It's not a tip. It doesn't go to the driver. It just reimburses the corporation for the fact that in some cases they might have to pay a minimum wage. That's how heinous uh, like hidden fees are. And this is something that appeals to a lot of people in America. And I'm not just talking about delivery things. There's This is common across... Oh my God, it's crazy common. The amount of um, lawsuits that have been brought against telecom companies because cell co cell co cellular companies love their hidden fees. They love their hidden fees. So this is something that I feel like Joe Biden should have front loaded because it's something that a lot of people can understand. People who might not watch the whole 40 minutes of the State of the Union address, but it's something they can understand and appreciate. Something that he's actually paying attention to the fact that joe biden and his administration at no and are thinking about hidden fees at all is a good sign for a lot of people kevin maxwell smith with the incredibly generous five dollars the gop response is a wasteland of conservative talking points only to be trudged by the wary demon mama be prepared for peak cringe. All right, we'll check it out. All right, we'll check We'll check it out. Fine, we'll do it. Let's continue. We got to finish this up, though. Folks at home, that's why the banks are so mad. It's $20 billion in profit. Rahab says, what are hidden fees? Uh, the thing that I just described. Hidden fees are basically a thing that corporations can technically legally do. Uh, it's extra additional fees. Uh, a, a good example of this is like um, when you buy a ticket. Um, the, the, honestly, the hidden fees discourse, a lot of that started because of a corporation here called Ticketmaster, which is basically a mega corporation that controls a vast majority of uh, like concert and sports ticket sales. And they are notorious for it. Basically, you'll get a price on a ticket. And then when you go to check out, it'll be like $30 more. And they'll have a little thing. It'll be like, see what fees, you know, uh, it'll be like ticket fees. And then you'll be like fees, what the hell? And then you have to like click another menu to see or click through to another window. And they'll say a uh, servicing fee, a uh, processing fee. And they're all these vaguely named fees that they just add on that are literally just them scraping more money and they often will reference something but they're they don't by law in america they don't have to actually like itemize it in most cases so they can just be whatever they don't have to prove to you that you're actually paying for something they're just adding it on and uh if that sounds kind of corrupt and disgusting like wait a second so like you not only are you know have your hand in control of the price of tickets but you also are just inventing random things to charge people it almost sounds kind of like highway robbery like daylight fucking robbery uh yeah it, it is and basically hidden fees have become more and more common and they're really egregious because sometimes they crawl into your monthly bills so when you pay for internet there might be a hidden uh service maintenance fee which who knows what that actually is for? And you can't really reasonably figure out what it's for. They just make you pay it. And if you don't, you don't get your your internet or your phone or whatever, or your water. It's pretty bad. The problem uh, of hidden fees is really bad in America. And it affects mostly the majority of people affected by it are poor people. Um, because they're the ones whose, whose paychecks are most impacted by it and who are most likely to be unable to negotiate out of hidden fees. So, yeah. And then, of course, he's talking about overdrafts here, which is another good thing for him to talk about, which is another disgusting thing that happens in America, which is that until very recently, um, banks were allowed to charge you if you accidentally um, pay, if you accidentally charged more to your credit card than you have on balance and uh some places some banks are so fucked up so first of all they have the ability and the technology to decline the fee you know if you run your card and you don't have enough money on it uh they have the ability to just decline the card however um 
because of overdraft fees, they can just decide not to do that. And it will actually put you into a negative balance, which means you owe money to the bank. And not only because you owe money to the bank and they had to help you cover your bill, they can then charge you a service fee or what is called an overdraft fee. An overdraft fee is another amount that they determine on top of uh, however much you went in the negative. And what's even crazier is that in a lot of places, now in some states this is outlawed, but in a lot of American states it's not, they can actually charge you an overdraft fee on the overdraft fee, and then an overdraft fee on that overdraft fee. And if that sounds like they could basically continually charge you an infinite amount of money for a mistake that they could easily prevent that doesn't actually cost them anything, yeah, that's actually what they can do. And it's actually possible for people to get in debt purely on overdraft fees, which are preventable. Some banks are so egregious that they will actually make you pay a monthly amount out of your account for overdraft protection, which means that instead of making you go and do an overdraft, you can pay $2 a month just deleted out of your account so that the bank won't do that to you. Genuinely disgusting, actually filthy. And uh, Joe Biden didn't get rid of overdrafts. The rational thing of any person would be able to see that that is a heinous and evil thing. However, he did uh, severely limit the amount of overdraft fees um, that you can uh, uh, that you can actually charge. The Biden administration passed a rule that basically says that they can only charge you like, God, what was it? Uh, let me let me double check. I want to get the specifics on this one. Let me look at this real quick. It is a benchmark fee between three and $14, depending on where it is. So that is the maximum amount that they are allowed, uh, allowed to charge is between three and $14, depending on where you are and the amount in overdraft. So uh, currently the average overdraft fee in the United States is $26. Uh, his law drops it to somewhere between three and fourteen dollars, depending on your local jurisdiction. So obviously, not a complete solution, but a huge step up. Instead of uh, twenty twenty-five to thirty-five dollars being charged because of a totally preventable thing that banks can easily stop from happening, um, yeah. yeah, So yeah. I hope that makes sense. That was a little bit of a, a, a big, uh, um, uh, a big fucking ramble, but I hope that makes sense. Banks are still going to stack purchase in a way to force the most overdraft fees. Yeah, of course they have complete control over it, but it's still significantly better. Uh, most places are going to be pretty low. Uh, I, d I think that overdraft fees should be illegal. Um, that a bank should just have to decline the charge and that's it. If you don't have enough in your account, they decline the charge. It's that simple. They obviously can do it. They do it most of the time. Most rational banks will do that. Um, but yeah, instead they can s carve people for free money. Uh, basically, a an, an advanced, it almost seems like a legal scam to me, you know? And I think it should be illegal. Chariot says, I once got a $50 overdraft fee once after a cell phone bill happened to go bad at a bad time, go through at a bad time. Terrible. Anyway, let's continue. Let's continue. Great to see you, Chariot, by the way. Also, uh, I, I noticed uh, I missed I missed welcoming Tipster. Welcome to the chat, Tipster. It's great to have you. Sorry for uh, for not getting to shout you out before. We have some we have some great people in here. We got High Progressive Chariot. We got Tipster here tonight, looking great. All right, let's do this. Oh, Gayfesh, Gayfesh, welcome. Happy to see you. I hope your watching was great. Hope your uh, Oscar watch was wonderful. Anyway, let's continue. Welcome to everyone who's here. What a what a great crew we've got tonight. I'm not stopping there. My administration has proposed rules to make cable, travel, utilities, and online ticket sellers tell you the total price up front 
Oh, look, there, he, he actually brought up the online ticket sellers. Like I said, the conversation around hidden fees really kicked up to a, 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 a high level with ticket sales. Uh, oddly enough, this is kind of a Taylor Swift thing. Uh, the Taylor Swift fandom, which is huge, was getting... Uh, basically, a bunch of people in the fandom were complaining about how much money was being spent basically scraped from them in ticket sales and it caused a giant social media thing and people started paying attention to it more. So there are no surprises. It mattered. It mattered. And so does this. In November, my team began serious negotiation with a bipartisan group of senators. The result was a bipartisan bill with the toughest set of border security reforms we've ever seen. Oh, you don't think so? Hold on a second. Whoa, 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 whoa. By again, serious negotiation of the bi- In November, my team began serious negotiation of the bipartisan group of senators. The result was a bipartisan bill with the toughest set of border security reforms we've ever seen. Bro. This is exactly what we were just talking about. Joe Biden ran on the nightmare at the border that was happening under Trump. Remember, remember kids in cages? Joe Biden is now currently boasting about the fact that he set out to make the mo the toughest border uh, bipartisan border bill that has ever been passed. Like that's something he should be fucking proud of. This is literally, uh, you notice, you know how liberals love to do the, um, the 99% the Hitler versus 100% Hitler thing. And they're like, you should always vote for the 99% Hitler. This is not, ow. Oh, I just bit my own tongue, ow. This is 99% Hitler going out of his way to say, I worked with 100% Hitler to get 99.5% Hitler law passed. That is so fucking pathetic. I just, and also it, it sells terribly to his core voter base. I don't know if you know about this, but a lot of Democrats actually do think that uh, disgusting and inhumane conditions at the border are a failure of American vision. They see that as a failure of delivery on the American dream. Democrats, liberals, and Joe Biden is here going, I helped pass the toughest border reform we've ever seen. I capitulated. Pathetic. Pathetic. Sad. Oh, you don't think so? Oh, you don't like that bill, huh? That conservatives got together and said it was a good bill? I'll be darned. That's amazing. That bipartisan bill would hire 1,500 more security. Jerry the Weeb says, just this week, I was negative $500 in overdraft fee fees. They should be illegal. They should be illegal. That sounds, that, that actually negative 500 sounds already illegal. Um, I would say contact a lawyer, but the problem is with these types of things is that if you're negative $500, you have a hard time paying a lawyer, which is kind of what the banks bank on haha <laughs> i'm sorry to hear that i hope you're able to get out of the situation and yes overdraft fees should be illegal the agents and officers 100 more immigration judges help tackle the backload of two million cases 4,300 more asylum officers and new policies so they can resolve cases in six months instead of six years now What are you against? One hundred more high-tech drug detection machines to significantly increase the ability to screen and stop vehicles smuggling fentanyl into America. That's there he goes, banging that drug war drum again. Remember what I said at the beginning about how his uh, his his claims about uh, being anti-political violence is full of shit. He's literally right now banging the drug war drum. We're, we're, you know, we got, we got advanced detection things to stop the flow of drugs coming in from the South. Killing thousands of children. 
This bill would save lives and bring order to the border. It would also give me and any new president new emergency authority to temporarily shut down the border. Joe Harkonnen has imported a hundred more poison sniffers to ensure that uh, that that Fremen rebels aren't aren't running spice into our cities. Border when the number of migrants at the border is overwhelming. The Border Patrol Union has endorsed this bill. The Federal Chamber of Commerce is yeah yeah. You're saying low. Look at the facts. I know. I know you know how to read. I believe that given the opportunity for a majority in the House and Senate would endorse the bill as well, a majority right now. But unfortunately, politics has derailed this bill so far. I'm told my predecessor called members of Congress in the Senate to demand they block the bill. He feels political win. He viewed it as a would be a political win for me and a political loser for him. It's not about him. It's not about me. I'd be a winner, not really. I. Uh oh. Uh oh. Uh oh. Oh no, he's falling apart. Oh, and and Kamala's got the pain face on. Lincoln, Lincoln Riley, an innocent young woman who was killed by an illegal. That's right. But how many of the thousands of people being killed by illegals? To her parents, I say, my heart goes out to you, having lost children myself. I understand. But look, if we change the dynamic at the border, people pay people, people pay these smugglers 8,000 bucks to get across the border because they know if they get by, if they get by and let into the country, it's six to eight years before they have a hearing. Did he just pick up a, hold on a second. Hold on. What, what is this? Is this say, is this a, what is, I, I have not heard of this before this event. Oh, uh, when I search it, it's literally all like right wing news orgs. Is this like a, is this some kind of like right wing campaign or something? What is this shit? Marjorie Taylor Greene wore a t-shirt to the State of the Union that carried a seemingly simple message. Say her name. Green used the rallying cry to successfully goad Joe Biden into saying the name Lakin Riley, a nursing student from Georgia whose death is now at the center of a U.S. immigration debate. Okay. Why does he have a pin up there? Why would he do that? Why would he why would he let Marjorie Taylor Green get him to do that? I, I'm sorry. I I'm I'm unsure exactly what's going on here. Like it seems like a tragedy genuinely occurred. MTG forced it on him at the very beginning. Why would he hold that up? She's one of the most deranged Republicans. Why would you? And also, she's a notorious troll. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Let's keep going. He's starting to fall apart here.
He really bungled that last bit. And it's worth the, taking the chance of the $8,000. But, but, if it's only six months, six weeks, the idea is it's highly unlikely that people will pay that money and come all that way, knowing that they'll be able to be kicked out quickly. Folks, what? I would respectfully say, to suggest my, friend, my Republican friends owe it to the American people, get this bill done. We need to act now. The Dems in this country are so fucking cooked. This is not like, first of all, that entire segment, he was bumbling and stumbling over himself and completely incoherent. Secondly, the Dems clapping for what they started the segment by selling as the most, uh, what, what did he say? It was the, the, the strictest, the harshest, uh, uh, a border reform bipartisan bill this is pathetic and it really does um you know it, it really does it, it does give the i the the impression of a controlled opposition doesn't it where the republicans basically say the most insane and deranged shit you can possibly imagine 24 7 and then for literally no reason at all the democrats just decide to capitulate to them for no benefit. For no fucking benefit. What person, what Democrat is going to look at this and go, yeah, that's the president I want. I feel like he's going to give me what I want. When Democrats look at the Republican Party and go, those guys are deranged psychos and I want nothing to do with them. And then they see their president bumbling through, capitulating to the Republicans while they boo him. During his capitulation, you would think, you would think if the, if the tactic was working that the Republicans would go, yeah, we loved working with you. Nope. They're bullying him even as he capitulates to them. They are shoving his face in the dirt on national TV during his State of the Union. We are cooked. Okay. That is some fucking, that is, that is some very, very bad signs for the state of American politics. And if my predecessor is watching, instead of paying politics and pressuring members of Congress to block the bill, join me in telling the Congress to pass it. We can do it together. But that's what he apparently hears what he will not do. I will not demonize immigrants saying they are poison in the blood of our country. I will not separate families. <laughs> He already did. <laughs> I will not ban people because of their faith. Unlike my predecessor on my first day in office, I introduced a comprehensive bill to fix our immigration system. Take a look at it, as all these and more. Secure the border. Provide a pathway to citizenship for dreamers. And so much more. But unlike yeah, that's a good point. Danny Fallon says that he did literally demonize this person. That, that the person who's been accused of the crime has not been proven guilty yet. And the president of the United States just said that he was. That's really, that's actually very fucked up. And he did that because Marjorie Taylor Greene handed him a button. Joe Biden, this is, that is, I mean, thank God that this happened 45 minutes into the State of the Union. Because most people will have tuned out by now. But let's be real. We should, anybody who gives a shit about it, this, about the fucking world at all, anybody who gives a shit about America at all should be looking at this and have a deep sense of fucking horror about the direction that politics is going. This is what passes for the Republican opposition in 2024. This is such a goddamn bad sign. Oh my God. My predecessor, I know who we are as Americans. We're the only nation in the world with a heart and soul that draws from old and new. Home to Native Americans and ancestors have been here for thousands of years. Home to people of every place, from every place on earth. They came freely. Some came in chains. 
Some came when famine struck, like my ancestral family in Ireland. Some to flee persecution, to chase dreams that are impossible anywhere but here in America. That's America. And we all come from somewhere, but we're all American. <laughs> Look, folks, we have a simple choice. We can fight about fixing the border, or we can fix it. I'm ready to fix it. Send me the border bill now. A transformational moment in history happened 58, 59 years ago today in Selma, Alabama. Hundreds of foot soldiers from Texas marched across the Edmund Pettus Bridge, named after the Grand Dragon of the Ku Klux Klan, to claim their fundamental right to vote. They were beaten, they were bloody, and left for dead. <laughs> 85D2D Derek, thank you so much for the $5. 85D2D Derek says, this speech really reminds me of Friday Night Funkin'. Every time Joe goes for a while without making a mistake, Kamala bobs her head and claps. And every time he goofs, every time he goofs, she shakes her, fa her face in pain. Incredible. Beautiful. True. Our late friend and former colleague, John Lewis, was on that march. We miss him. Joining us tonight, our other marchers, both in the gallery and on the floor, including Betty Mae Fikes, known as the voice of Selma, the daughter of gospel singers and preachers. She sang songs of prayer and protest on that bloody Sunday to help shake the nation's conscience. Five months later, the Voting Rights Act passed and was signed into law. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. But 59 years later, their force is taking us back in time. Voter suppression, election subversion, unlimited dark money, Extreme gerrymandering. John Lewis is a great friend to many of us here. But if you truly want to honor him and all the heroes of March with him, then it's time to do more than talk. Pass the Freedom to Vote Act. The John Lewis Voting Right Act. And stop. Stop denying another core value of America, our diversity across American life. Banning books, it's wrong. Instead of erasing history, let's make history. I want to protect fundamental rights. Pass the Equality Act. And my message to transgender Americans, <clears throat> I have your back. Pass the PRO Act for workers' rights. Raise the federal minimum wage. Well, trans people got one line from the president. Meanwhile, a roaring culture war targeting trans people perpetrated by Democrats, perpetrated by leaders, or not by Democrats, by Republicans, perpetrated by leaders in the Republican Party all across the country has been raging for years and we've barely heard anything about it from Joe Biden. Joe Biden said that he had trans people's back at the beginning of his election. And then he stood by and watched while state after state after state passed disgusting, draconian, authoritarian laws oppressing the rights of trans people, invading the lives of trans people and their families. 
he's capitulating and attempting to work with people who have who have gone out of their way to persecute trans people and then he tries to tell trans people i have your back no one believes that no one believes that i know a lot of trans people okay and I don't know a single trans person who feels like Joe Biden has got their back or the Joe Biden administration is looking out for them. I've heard and seen and hear a lot of fear about Donald Trump. And I don't hear, see, or feel a whole lot of relief about the idea of Joe Biden because Joe Biden has stood by and remained silent outside of literally a single goddamn line. I got your backs. Meanwhile, an entire swath of America has swung into the goddamn uh, dark ages with regards to trans acceptance. An entire swath of red states have lost their fucking minds due to a truly deranged and evil, and I mean that, truly evil, culture war driven against trans people rampant uh, uh, bigotry, rampant misinformation, just the most deranged uh, uh, libel you can imagine directed at trans people on a constant and daily basis. And Joe Biden, all he has to say is, I got your back, one line at the end of the State of the Union. Luna Rose 161 says, so what? Bury our heads in the sand and let Trump win so we all die? Um, that can be your solution. Maybe you should do that. I am so fucking tired of people like you. I am so goddamn tired of idiots like yourself who have so little self-respect, who are so fucking cucked, so doomer, that you can't even conceptualize of critiquing the reigning fucking president of the United States when he has stood by and done nothing for you in the middle of the most deranged, libelous, fucking uh, uh, culture war bullshit where every single day talking heads in the Republican Party are ranting about how they want to kill all the groomers and how they want to drive and eradicate trans people from public life and Joe Biden can manage to go, I got your backs, and do fucking nothing. And when I point that out, you go, so I should just die then? Shut the fuck up. How about this? How about you shut the fuck up forever? How about you just never talk? That would be a better solution. People like you should learn to have a goddamn fucking spine and a functioning fucking brain. I'm so goddamn tired of it. It's I've seen it so fucking much. Every time I even try to critique Biden, anytime I bring up something negative, a hundred fucking losers show up out of nowhere to go, well, what, so I should just die then? Shut the fuck up. The man is the reigning president and he's bundling it. This fucking drooling idiot is going to guarantee with his own fucking actions that that bitch, Donald Trump, is going to be president again. And you get mad when I point that fact out. That Joe Biden has been shooting himself in the goddamn balls for three years, but especially in election year. It's the middle of goddamn March. And this guy is failing to appeal to the basic people in his goddamn own electorate. And you're mad at me and you're telling me I'm telling you to lay down and die? That's fucking crazy. You're fucking crazy. Stupid. I'm tired of people with no solutions. You mean the Democrats? I don't know, newsflash, motherfucker. I'm not the president of the United States. I'm not the fucking president. I'm a live streamer. I'm giving you my opinions and I'm critiquing the most powerful man in the world. The solution is, I've, in fact, I've done entire videos. The crazy fucking thing about people like yourself is that I've done entire videos on my channel talking about exactly this. I've said exactly what I think Joe Biden himself should do. But guess what? Joe Biden doesn't fucking listen to me.
And he doesn't listen to you either. He doesn't fucking care. Joe Biden is fighting for political power. And the least that you can do is have the self-respect necessary to know how to listen to a critique of the guy and internalize that into your fucking crusty brain. I've been fairly angry this stream because I don't feel like I've even been that hard on Joe Biden. In fact, I've motherfucking praised the guy during this, but crawling out of the woodwork is a bunch of people who have stupid shit to say to me. The most asinine and pointless shit, and I can't fucking stand it anymore. I can't, I, I, I don't know how the fuck I'm supposed to sit here and act fucking normal when I say, guys, it's actually pretty bad that Joe Biden d has basically done nothing in a meaningful way. The most powerful man in the world hasn't used even 1% of his power to try and stop an insane genocidal culture war being driven, being ramped up a literal medical legal assault on trans people who are a tiny percentage of the population. And the most powerful guy in the world knows this. He knows they're doing this and he can't work it up to do it. And then a bunch of people go, so you're saying we should just vote for Trump? So you're saying we should just lay down and die? No, motherfucker. Holy fucking God. Over and over and over again, I encounter this. And it's been years. You guys, this shit is pathetic. It's pathetic. The fact that people can't go, wow, this is, this is fucked up. The fact that, that people feel the need to pretend that this isn't the circumstances that we live in, that we are not sitting here with a president whose best that he can muster for an incredibly vulnerable and highly persecuted minority in our country is, I have your back after fucking bumbling through four fucking different sections uh, uh, of, of him capitulating to the right wing while they bully him further from the right. Fuck off my Xbox jet now! True, Danny. True. Holy shit. Brutus Magnuson. I think our best move is to try to figure out how we can get under his skin without helping the other guy. And that isn't easy. We can't get under his skin. I need you all to understand that Joe B Biden is, he, he isn't even in the same plane of existence as you, okay? This is a man who wields the power to obliterate the entire planet. This man carries around with him a suitcase that has the power to obliterate the planet, okay? You don't get under that guy's skin, okay? That's not how this works. What we can do is we can communicate to one another. We can hopefully observe these things and we can try and take care of each other and build structures that keep us alive despite the roiling of these demented old men. What we can do is we can confront people 
who are deluded by propaganda. And that is what it is. The propaganda that tells you that you just have to sit there and be okay when Joe Biden uh, tells you that he's the guy who's going to save the planet and that if you don't vote for him, it's the end of the fucking world. And then you look and you go, hey, dude, you said you were going to take care of people four years ago. People voted for you. People worked really hard for you. Some of you people in my audience canvassed and campaigned for Joe Biden. I know there are people in my audience who worked for the Dems to get this guy elected and have, and have and, and now live in states where their rights have been stripped because he couldn't even lift his pinky finger to say, trans Americans, I stand with you no matter what. And this nonsense that is being peddled to give four or five speeches to set a guy a, 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 a role who a, 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 a position of power to make a cabinet position or a, an appointee that can go and ensure that their that their job is to go and counter misinformation about trans people to constantly be in communication with the Democratic Party that the opposition is spending an inordinate amount of their time trying to find a way to persecute one percent of the populace it actually is a pretty big deal that, that, that the Democrats are ignoring the fact that Republicans are talking about this constantly. They're not exactly being secret about it. It's not like they don't know. Republicans are bringing up trans people in the fucking halls of Congress constantly. And Dems just sit there with a blank look on their face. Jesus Christ. I really didn't, I didn't expect the State of the Union to be the topic that made me lose my fucking shit tonight. That made me go on a fucking screaming rant. But watching people sit in chat and, and li literally ignore the words that are coming out of my mouth. And, and not just that, but go out of their way to say things that I didn't say. Like a, like a, like a, a, a like it, it's not even, doesn't even resemble the things that I've said. Drives me fucking bonkers, especially on this particular topic. It feels like being gaslit by a bunch of fucking random people on the internet when it's been years of me talking about this subject. And people act like, like they're like, yeah, we... So you're acknowledging the fact that like, that Joe Biden isn't doing good enough. Well, you know, so I'm just supposed to give up? I don't know, is that your solution? I'm doing what I can do. I don't know if you, I don't know, do you have a, do you, are you, do you live with Joe Biden? Do you have a phone you can pick up and call Joe Biden? Why don't you fucking do it then? I don't know, I can't contact Joe Biden. I can't even contact a person who can even contact Joe Biden. I can't contact a person who can contact, who can contact, who can contact, I'm like, a million degrees of separation from Joe Biden right now. But you know what I do have to feel? I do have to feel the pain of people that I know fucking suffering while he goes and says, I got your back in one line of the State of the Union. Meanwhile, uh, Republicans all across the country will devote entire hours of speeches talking about how they're going to persecute people like me. Look, 
I'm not just talking about you, Luna, and I shouldn't have I shouldn't have flown off the handle in your in your specific direction. But fucking Christ. Like, you know, when you when you post something in a public chat, you know, and it's it's going to be hyperbolic. You might get a hyperbolic, you know, not even a hyperbolic. You might get a strong response in return. Cuz I don't think what I said was fucking hyperbolic. Now, I do have a problem because it's been happening for the entire fucking stream. I've had to see people saying ridiculous things about me and it, it pushes me, okay? And you're right, I apologize. I shouldn't have gone as hard on you specifically. But there is a, a recurring theme. There is a, there is a genre of response that I get to me pointing out a very, very fucking basic response to, to, to Joe Biden, when I go, that's fucking not enough. That's not good enough, my man. You're, that there's, there's a response that I get and I keep getting it over and over and over again. And it drives me up a wall. And I feel like I've kept my cool it's been a long time since I've had a chat blow up. But you got me today. All right. Luna got all the smoke, but for no reason. Look, sometimes that's how it works, okay? And I apologize. Luna, I shouldn't have given you all the smoke, okay? I shouldn't have given you all of it, all right? But let's, you know, let's, let's fucking consider for a second what I'm actually saying. There's a... I'm not, it's not, I did fucking freak out, okay? So don't, let's not, you don't, you don't need to pad me down. I did have a bit, little bit of a, I had a little bit of a meltdown, okay? This is what we call a little bit of a meltdown, all right? But it was a long time coming, okay? The reactor's been running hot for a long time, and I've kept the lid on, despite undue heat. But I shouldn't have directed it all at you. I had, a game, I had a gamer moment, okay? Nuts, of course you've seen me more pissed. Consider this my apology, Luna, okay? I'm sorry. I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have fucking hit you with the thermonuclear bombs. To be fair, I don't need to be fair to me. I shouldn't have hit you with it, okay? I hope you can accept my apology for going off the rails. In truth, I was ranting at a conglomerate of people. Not just you. All right. Apology accepted, says L Luna. We, we can make peace. But don't think the rest of you are off the fucking hook. And my previous meltdown, that one was justified. This one was a little unjustified. The other rant, that one. I'm not apologizing for that one. <laughs> Missed the rant. Okay, to be fair, I shouldn't say it was a rant. I did I did have a bit of a meltdown. All right, listen, just a little bit, okay? You know, I used to I used to bring that spice a lot more. I've I've been even keel for a long time. All right. But not today. Do we even need to finish this shit? Do we, is there anything else that he's going to say in the next 10 minutes? Because every worker has a right to a decent living more than a seven bucks an hour. We're also making history by confronting the climate crisis. Not the he did, High Progressive. It was bad. Oh, we got to talk about Gaza. Of course he saves it to the end. Now that right there. 
saving the Gaza to the to an hour in to an hour into your goddamn State of the Union speech. That's what we call a strategy. Okay, that says something in and of itself. Nine. I don't think any of you think there's no longer a climate crisis. At least I hope you don't. I'm taking the most significant action ever on climate in the history of the world. I'm cutting our carbon emissions in half by 2030, creating tens of thousands of clean energy jobs like the IBW workers building and installing 500,000 electric vehicle charging stations. Conserving 30% of America's lands and waters by 2030. I'm taking action on environmental justice fence line communities smothered by the legacy of pollution and pattern after the Peace Corps and America Corps, I launched the Climate Corps to put 20,000... Yes, we hit that too, 85 to 2D, Derek. ...thousand young people to work in the forefront of our clean energy future. I'll triple that number in a decade. ...future. 20,000 young people to work in the forefront of our clean energy future. I'll triple that number in a decade. To state the obvious, all Americans deserve the freedom to be safe. And America is safer today than when I took office. The year before I took office, murder rates went up 30 percent. 30 percent they went up. What? took office, murder rates went up 30 percent. 30 percent they went up. The biggest increase in what? What are they? What are they saying? I can't even hear what he's saying. What's he saying? Up. The biggest increase in history. It was then, through no, through my American Rescue Plan, which I'm actually kind of surprised. Um, did he say United States Marines? This is, uh, there's been a lot of heckling in this State of the Union. I've seen a lot of State of the Unions, and there's almost never this much heckling. It's actually kind of crazy how much there's been. Like, I'm serious. It usually doesn't happen that much. I don't know what he's talking about, but. It's because Republicans are more deranged than they've ever been. I mean, that's absolutely true. It's just usually the State of the Union is a fairly chill event. It's not the type of thing that uh, people usually, like, scream at. It's just kind of an odd thing to notice. Man yelling, remember Abby Gate. Oh, Okay. Yeah, so he was mad about a Marine that got killed in the pullout from Afghanistan. Okay. All right. Okay, bro. The American voted against, I'm mad at. I mean, it's kind of like, it's kind of weird. It's kind of weird to, po to protest deaths of American soldiers on the pullout of a war an ongoing war that was continuing to kill americans like americans were continuing to die in afghanistan so that just seems like a weird thing to do i, I don't know it seems like a weird a weird thing to protest that's all i'm saying we made the largest investment in public safety ever last year the soldier was his son yeah but that still doesn't really change Right? That doesn't really change the thing. It's kind of a strange thing to protest. Like, if, you're, if your son dies in Afghanistan, wouldn't that be more the fault of people who perpetuated the war? It's, it's a very, it's just kind of a weird thing. In my opinion, that's kind of a weird thing, a weird way to protest. Like, losing somebody in the military is not easy. Um, the military, like, 
nobody wants to lose a loved one who went into the military and people often go into the military because they've been heavily propagandized to because they have been you know basically told that it'll deliver them from their financial and life troubles it's not a good thing i can understand how sad and terrible that would be i just find it very weird to like protest that during the state of the union during this section be like because joe biden pulled out of a war like he was done with the war it seems like stopping Amer american military involvement would actually um save lives i don't know i don't know losing your child in a war does not lead to rational thinking grief can make people irrational sure uh, yeah no doubt that it much is absolutely true for sure no doubt no denying that here the murder rates are the sharpest decrease in history violent crime fell to one of its lowest levels in more than 50 years but we have more to do we have to help cities invest in more community police officers more mental health workers more community violence intervention Give communities the tool to crack down on gun crime, retail crime, and carjacking. Keep building trust, as they've been doing by taking executive action on police reform. Give the tool to crack down on more community violence than intervention. Give communities the tool to crack down on gun crime, retail crime, and carjacking. Keep building. What? Did he just slip in that we're going to crack down on crime? He's our Democratic president. We're going to crack down specifically on retail crime? That is a right-wing conspiracy talking point. The retail crime thing is literally like a far-right obsession. They obsess over weird videos of shoplifting, despite the fact that there's none of their claims are based in reality whatsoever. Oh, whatever. Jesus Christ. At this point, I just feel like, is this not, is this speech not exactly what I was talking about earlier with the constant, the absolute constant, uh, uh, needless uh, uh, bending over to the right? Trust as they've been doing by taking executive action on police reform. Yeah, exactly. As Nutt says, the Walgreens CEO literally lied. Yeah, and he had to cop to it. He had to, he had to cop to the fact that actually, no, they ended up spending more money trying to crack down on shoplifting uh, than they would have if they hadn't made a big deal about shoplifting. He lied completely and misrepresented why they were struggling, when in reality, they were struggling because their competition was beating them. And right wingers have run with this. They quoted, they've quoted this this Walgreens CEO forever. And of course, they never update their information because they don't actually care about the issue. It's just really weird. It's really weird to hear Democrat President Joe Biden, you know, uh, uh, Chairman Joe, talking about how he wants to give communities the tools to crack down on retail theft. More retro with the $2 super chat. Thank you very much. Says, yeah, what about paycheck and crimes against workers? That's a good question. What about pay theft? Wage theft? He doesn't care about that, apparently. And yeah, whatever. He's calling for it to be the law of the land. <laughs> Directing my cabinet to review the federal classification of marijuana and expunging thousands of convictions for the mere possession because no one should be jailed for simply using or having it on their record. Four years you had to do that. Why? Why? And also, listen to the caveats there. Oh, we, let's, let's, let's listen through that again. What are the caveats he's got here? I'm going to direct my cabinet to review the federal possession rules because no one should be jailed for simply having or using uh, uh, marijuana on their record. Hmm. That seems like one of those situations, man. Weed is pretty fucking popular in the United States and always has been. It was always insane to do the drug war against marijuana. It's very obvious that marijuana was being used as a way to essentially arrest whoever the fuck you want 
for an incredibly commonplace drug that is less damaging than fucking alcohol. Uh, this is just pathetic. I don't know. Does anybody, honest, honest question, okay? I know I've yelled at a lot of people. I'm not gonna yell at anyone, I promise. I'm not gonna melt down, I'm chill. I've calmed myself, all right? I've gained, regained control, okay? But honestly, I saw people on Twitter talking about that they felt this was good. Is anybody here really feeling energized or motivated by this for real? I, I promise I won't even get mad about it, okay? I just, I, I really don't believe. It's better than it could have been. Okay, that's fair. I mean, yeah, it always, it always could be worse. There's a few zingers. Yeah, I feel that. I certainly feel energized. Okay, well, I might have energized you. It was good optics. Do you, do we think it was good optics for real? I don't think there was a lot of, I don't know, I guess it depends on the optics. I don't think it was good optics for his own voter base. His own voter base isn't motivated by cracking down on crime. They're not motivated by him saying he's going to make a tough, tough border deal. Lucy says, not going to lie, Lucy, for obvious reasons. By the way, Lucy, it's great to see you. I'm sorry I was ragingly mad when you came in and I didn't catch you. Welcome to the stream. Wonderful to see you. Lucy's not going to lie, for obvious reasons, likes the parts when he says Ukraine needs aid. Okay, yeah. I, I, did, I did think that he did a pretty good job on that part overall. It wasn't complete garbage. All right. That's awesome, Smelody. I'm happy that I was able to do that. It's kind of a shit show either way. For normies, the more conservative stuff probably came off as normal politician shit, maybe. Frost Throne says, I hope this is not ageist of me, but I wasn't expecting him to have enough stamina to last through the whole speech. So honestly, he exceeded my expectations. What I'm getting from this is I feel that the bar is very low for Joe, which to me, that's a kind of a bad sign, right? Like if the bar is so low that people didn't think he was going to be able to get through a one hour speech, to me, that feels like we're already in the bucket, you know, and that him crossing that bar is not a big thing. I saw people being like, Joe's on fire tonight. And I was like, what? Really? And now that I've seen it, I'm like, where was he on fire? Because I haven't seen a part where he's been on fire. He did make a few quips, but quips don't make a good State of the Union. Okay, I'll watch this afterwards. Save your rage for Dark Souls. Oh, there's no fucking chance we're, we're going to do Dark Souls tonight. Honestly, I'm so pissed off right now. I've considered that I should just end stream after this. <laughs> when I was a senator. So we can finally, finally. We'll see. I don't know. Maybe, maybe we'll keep going. I don't know. Finally end the scourge against women in America. Brutus Magnus had said, watching this on my, wo my own, watching it on Dylan Burns' stream, and watching it on De Demon Mama's stream all feel very different. Well, I mean, that's probably a good sign, right? Because that means that you're getting different perspectives. Um, I imagine Dylan was probably very positive about this because Dylan is very, very invested in, in the, uh, the issue on Ukraine, which uh, admittedly... While I think that uh, I think he took probably the best position that the president of the United States could, um, that's not my number one issue that I cover. Um, so it's not it's you know I'm not as invested as someone like Dylan, but I understand why people would be invested in that and why they would see that as a solid option. Vosh was right to get drunk as shit before watching this. <laughs> Did he get drunk as shit? Nuts says, nowadays I just watch Demon Mama and Vosh. I used to watch like 10 streamers constantly. I just couldn't do it anymore. Also, Twitch, Twitch poll kind of died in 2021. Yeah, it did. And also, trying to keep up with 10 streamers is kind of hard. I'm honored, Nuts. 
despite our various contentions, we also have a lot of good times, Nuts. I'm always happy to have you here. He was pretty sloshed. <laughs> that sounds kind of fun, I guess. Lucy says, Lucy feels invested in Ukraine since Lucy has people who have relatives fighting and got awarded. And also if Ukraine loses, Lucy's place might be next. Uh, it's not out of the question. Yeah, I, I can understand that completely. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't know. Right now, the Ukraine thing is basically, it is just a simple, uh, it, is a, it is a simple Republican versus Democrat issue. Uh, Republicans are pro-Putin because of the Donald Trump cult, and Democrats are pro-Ukraine. It's that simple. Uh, lefties, the, the like anti-Ukraine lefties are not a significant portion of, a, of, of any real political power, so you don't really have to worry about that. Uh, that said, you know, so there's not, I don't know, there's not all that much I can say about that particularly. He gave the, ex the response that I expected that he would give. Um, but yeah. Anyway, let's continue. Let's finish this out. We got to finish this shit up. There are other kinds of violence I want to stop. With us tonight is Jasmine, who's nine-year-old. Uh, Lucy says, not, not all Republicans are pro-Putin, more like the MAGA section. The MAGA section is the ruling party of the Republicans. Yes, there are dissenters, but they do not have, like the dissenters to the MAGA cult are not very well organized and they are losing badly. Um, it, the, the Republican... The, the Republican primaries went exactly as I predicted. Uh, the Republic, the, the like the, the, the path to presidency was identical to what I predicted, which is obviously no one is going to unseat Donald Trump. They're all going to get humiliated. None of them even came close. Most of them uh, under underdid their own expectations. They underdid everyone else's expectations. MAGA, the MAGA movement rules the Republican Party right now. They have the power and they continue to have that. So, yeah, um, it, while it's true that there are dissenters among the Republicans, that doesn't matter for as long as the MAGA, the MAGA section maintains control, and they're nowhere near even remotely being out of power. It could be possible that if Donald Trump kicks the bucket, um, that, uh, you know, that the MAGA gets scattered, but the MAGA movement in its current form is the dominant faction in the Republican Party, yeah. Thank you so much, Buck Moon. I really appreciate that. I kind of, I don't know. We'll talk after. We'll continue this. Arlo says, Demon Mom is the only streamer I still watch. Well, that's good. The, the, there is still a, uh, there is still a, a light shining. You're going to hate me for that one, but, you know, cope. Uh, more retro with the $10 says, I am still riding with Biden because of living through DeSantis. We have no choices, but I'm getting Nikki Fried fla flashback. Leftist dialogue makes me want to run Charlie C. Nikki Fried overview stream, please. I don't know what the Charlie C. Nikki Fried overview stream is, but uh, I completely get it. I understand people who want Biden to win. I would prefer if Joe Biden wins. In fact, a lot of my critiques, you'll notice, are centered around the fact that I think that Joe Biden is going to make himself lose. But at the end of the day, I don't have Biden's ear. All I can do is shine a light on what is and how it's unfolding and hopefully convince people to move, to adopt a politics that is significantly deeper than just electoral politics. Which is, by the way, why you should press subscribe on my channel. One of the many reasons. You get to see me make jokes. You get to see me rage out once in a great while. You get to hear me talk about this stuff. And you can learn more about what I think about politics and how I think my unique approach to politics 
can genuinely encourage people to make better decisions. I think a lot of people spend a lot of their time watching the machinery of electoral politics and not a lot of time actually thinking about what ways they can actually affect that and also acknowledging the ways in which they can't and what they should be doing instead. You'll notice that a lot of the time that I spend talking about politics on this channel is not talking about electoral politics. It's talking about political questions with the goal of getting people to think. It's talking about how people can actually build their own and grow their own political power. You know, it's not just we do t take time out of our day to occasionally watch stuff like this. But um, most of what I do when I talk about politics is get people's brains flowing on different topics so that they can self-empower, so they can connect with other people and build alliances that will help them keep alive and well and thrive even in hard times. Um, political alienation, social alienation is a gigantic weak spot for everyone, I mean, for everyone, but for everyone outside of the right. The right has stringent structures that force people and often miserably into contact with one another, but they do work. And the left side of the sphere uh, has increasingly over the years suffered from more and more political and social alienation. And this is partially because of the dominance of liberal politics, liberal models of politics, which tell you that your job is to sit there and watch a machine that you have no real say in, you know? And, and then feel bad about it or get mad at other people about how they respond to the machine that none of you have an effect on. There's this, there's this like, it's almost like there's like a, like a, I don't know, it's like, the liberal mode of politics wants you to treat politics like a movie that you watch and then you argue about your theories about the movie. But at the end of the day, the movie is the movie. You can't change the movie on the screen. And I want to challenge people to, to change their approach to that. By the way, if that sounds like something you'd like, press subscribe down below. That's why you got to subscribe. And also make sure you press like. <sighs> All right, let's continue. Let's continue. Sister Jackie was murdered with 21 classmates and teachers in elementary school in Uvalde, Texas. Very soon after that happened, Jill and I went to Uvalde for a couple of days. We spent hours and hours with each of the families. We heard their message. So everyone in this room, in this chamber, could hear the same message. The constant refrain, and I was there for hours meeting with every family. They said, do something. Do something. Well, I did do something by establishing the first ever Office of Gun Violence Prevention in the White House, that the Vice President is leading the charge. Thank you for doing it. <clears throat> Meanwhile, <clears throat> Meanwhile, my predecessor told the NRA he's proud he did nothing on guns when he was president. Oof. After another shooting in Iowa recently, he said, when asked what to do about it, he said, just get over it. There's his quote, just get over it. I say, stop it. Stop it, stop it, stop it. <clears throat> I'm proud we beat the NRA when I signed most significant gun safety law in nearly 30 years because of this Congress. We now must beat the NRA again. I'm demanding a ban on assault weapons and high-capacity magazines. Pass universal background checks. None of this. None of this. I taught the Second Amendment for 12 years. None of this violates the Second Amendment or vilifies responsible gun owners. You know, as we manage challenges at home, we're also managing crises abroad, including in the Middle East. I know the last five months have been gut-wrenching for so many people, 
with Israeli people, for the Palestinian people, and so many here in America. Oh, boy. This crisis began on October 7th with a massacre by a terrorist group called Hamas, as you all know. 1,200 innocent people, women and girls, men and boys, slaughtered after enduring sexual violence. The deadliest day of the, for the Jewish people since the Holocaust. And 250 hostages taken. Here in this chamber tonight are families whose loved ones are still being held by Hamas. I pledge to all the families that we will not rest until we bring every one of your loved ones home. We also. <clears throat> yeah, also, it should be noted, let's just, let's not forget, okay, that the U.S. ally, Benjamin Netanyahu, has not only gone against the advice of the international community, but also the families of those hostages, and has put, and in fact, likely killed some of those hostages in his insane war against the Palestinian people. So it's all nice and good for Joe Biden to talk about those hostages who are no doubt in a terrifying and horrifying situation, but it, it rings very hollow when he has willingly and unequivocally stood by the side of a, of a guy who has thrown their lives away. Oh yeah, this is super interesting. Here you go, just real quick, just a, just a real quick nice little note, by the way. Today, Netanyahu, this was just 10 hours ago, Netanyahu vows to defy Biden's red line and invade Rafa. You know, it's very interesting that Joe Biden has spent the last few months enabling this murderous, genocidal, race purging fucking psychopath. And all he can say is sort of a weak, oh, it's so sad for those people who were hurt. And just days after the State of the Union, Netanyahu just openly states, yeah, fuck you, buddy, I'm not listening to you. The reality, of course, is that Joe Biden has basically been, you better not. Joe Biden has power. America has incredible power over Israel that they could flex and they aren't. Because Joe would rather be like, you better not do that, bucko. It will also work around the clock to bring home Evan and Paul, Americans being unjustly detained by the Russians and others around the world. Israel has the right to go after Hamas. Hamas ended this conflict by releasing hostages, laying down arms, could end it by, by releasing the hostages, laying down arms, and sur surrendering those responsible for October 7th. But Israel has a... <coughs> excuse me. Israel has a added burden because Hamas hides and operates among the civilian population like cowards under hospitals, daycare centers, and all the like. Oh, dude, he's literally just doing, and he's just doing fucking propaganda right now. So does fucking the Israeli military. They literally used civilian shields. We have video evidence that has been seen by the UN of the Israeli military kidnapping Palestinian civilians, uninvolved civilians, and using them as, as hostages, as human shields. Dude, this is terrible. This is fucking terrible. Israel also has a fundamental responsibility though, to protect innocent civilians in Gaza. That ship fucking sailed 
What is the what is the civilian death count right now? Let's just get a quick update. According to PBS, let's see, this was on February 19th. So that's a month ago. That's too old. What's the most recent one? I want to see if we can find the most recent one. From the first of this month, the BBC estimates more than 30,000 Palestinian civilians have now been killed in Gaza. Appro approximately 1.3% of the total population. And that's from the beginning of this month, and that's an estimate. NPR says official number on the 29th of February is 30,035 deaths. That is the most reliable one available. And the article leads by saying this is a this is known to be an incomplete count. That is just the known confirmed deaths. Unbelievable. That ship has sailed. Saying it like this in and of itself is disgusting apologia. Saying Israel has the responsibility to protect innocent civilians in Gaza when there are 30,000 dead already? I don't know. <clears throat> Do you guys, do you guys see why I've gotten so mad? I, I know, I don't want to harp on this. I really did lose my shit earlier and I was a little unfair, okay? And I, and I feel bad about it. I do feel bad. I shouldn't have gotten so fucking mad. But also, do you guys see why I get so fucking mad about this? Do you understand why I get so goddamn pissed off about this guy? The guy that for the last four fucking years even after he was elected, libs have been forcing this motherfucker down our throats. You better be ready to vote for him again. You better be ready. It's going to be the end. And no matter the the nightmare, no matter the, the fucking pathetic bullshit that he pulls, you are told if you so much as criticize him, you're doing something wrong. You guys see John Fetterman saying that, uh, that people who voted... Uh, uncommitted in a primary, in the Democratic primary, we're, we're, we're helping to elect Trump? That fucking ghoul. This is why I get so fucking pissed. This is why it gets me so goddamn This war and these fucking clapping seals obligated to clap. Mithra with the 10 pounds says, Owen Jones, probably the best Western journalist on Palestine, estimates 40,000 deaths so far. Thank you very much for supporting the show. I really do appreciate that. That is wild. has taken a greater toll on innocent civilians than all previous wars in Gaza combined. More than 30,000 Palestinians have been killed, most of whom are not Hamas. Thousands and thousands of innocents, women and children, girls and boys, also orphaned. Nearly two million more Palestinians under bombardment or displacement. Homes destroyed, neighbors in rubble, cities in ruin, families without food, water, medicine. It's heartbreaking. I've been working nonstop to establish an immediate ceasefire that would last for six weeks to get all the prisoners released, all the hostages released, to get the hostages home and ease the intolerable and humanitarian crisis and build toward an enduring, a more, something more enduring 
The United States has been leading international efforts to get more humanitarian assistance to Gaza. Tonight, I'm directing the U.S. military to lead an emergency mission to establish a temporary pier in the Mediterranean on the coast of Gaza that can receive large shipments carrying food, water, medicine, and temporary shelters. No U.S. boots will be on the ground. A temporary pier will enable a massive increase in the amount of humanitarian assistance getting into Gaza every day. Why did it, why did it do that? Why does it say that? A pillow, great to see you. Thanks for coming by. I, I don't want to even make a joke in this part. I don't got any jokes in me. I I just noticed that and it is kind of funny that it says the mommy resistance. I don't I don't get it. And Israel must do its part. Israel must allow more aid in the Gaza and ensure humanitarian workers aren't caught. Arlo in YouTube says, uh the, U the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs says 100,000 people injured, missing, or dead in Gaza. 100,000 people injured, missing, or dead. Let's hear what else he has to say. In the crossfire. And they're announcing they're gonna, they're gonna cross, have a crossing in northern Gaza. The leadership of Israel, I say this, humanitarian assistance cannot be a secondary consideration or a bargaining chip. Protecting and saving innocent lives has to be a priority. As we look to the future, the only real solution to the situation is a two-state solution over time. <clears throat> and I say this, as a lifelong supporter of Israel, my entire career, no one has a stronger record with Israel than I do. I challenge any of you here. I'm the only American president to visit Israel in wartime. But there is no other path that guarantees Israel's security and democracy. There is no other path that guarantees that Palestinians can live in peace with, with peace and dignity. And there's no other path that guarantees peace between Israel and all of its neighbors including Saudi Arabia, with whom I'm talking. Creating stability in the Middle East also means containing the threat posed by Iran. That's why I build a coalition of more than a dozen countries to defend international shipping and freedom of navigation in the Red Sea. I've ordered strikes to degrade the Houthi capability and defend U.S. forces in the region. As Commander-in-Chief, I will not hesitate to direct further measures to protect our people and our military personnel. <laughs> okay, so I think we've got what he has to say about Gaza, which is that he wants to call for a six-week ceasefire after we're already at, already at 100,000 injured, missing, or dead, and that he wants to establish a peer. And I was sent a, a, a link... Um, which this is from the Times of Israel. The Times of Israel. Biden says Israel will secure a new Gaza pier. Pentagon, it may take two months to build. So two more months before his pier idea will even come into effect. Now I have seen photos of parachuted supplies that Biden has dropped in. And there was an incredible photo. Uh, I wonder if I can find it. Um, I want to see if I can find this photo. I didn't have it on hand. There was a photo that showed both supplies raining in and bombardment from Israel at the same time. I want to see if I can find... Hold on, let's see. Oh man, there's so many photos of the supply drops. There was one where you could see uh, the clouds of bombardment at the same time 
as the uh, the airdrop supplies were coming in. I don't know if I'm going to be able to find it now. Oh, that sucks. Regardless, it was a it was a great visual representation of the uh, current situation. And of course, I'm not going to say that it's Obviously, I think it's a good thing that Biden was willing to airdrop supplies into the um, desperate and starving people uh, in Gaza. But uh, it all just feels like way too little, way too late. When you were not willing to, to, to make that step until there were 100,000 missing, injured, and dead, until you got to the, the official count of around 30,000 people dead. Like, and, and the entire time you were saying, we are not going to budge in supporting Netanyahu while Netanyahu has been spitting in the face of the world. It really does come off as too little too late. And I'm happy to hear that he's proposing a ceasefire. But I want to see what he means when he says proposing. Because if he just says it in the State of the Union, that's not good enough. And, this, and that's not going to be good enough for his electorate either. His voter base is not going to be okay with him just saying it in a speech. This is one of the issues that Democratic voters are most activated on. This is one of the issues in which he has alienated so, so much of his voter base. Because as it turns out, people take the topic of genocide seriously. And, and some people out there might take objection to me saying the word genocide. But I don't hesitate to say the word genocide in this particular incident. The intent is there. The structure is there. The deaths are there. The, the leadership of Israel has been open in the language that they use in their intent to to purge living people from land that they wish to control. And as it turns out, Democratic voters tend to take that issue very, very seriously. So this all comes off as way too little, way too late. All right, let's finish this. For years, I've heard many of my Republican and Democratic friends say that China is on the rise and America's falling behind. They've got it backwards. I've been saying it for over four years, even when I wasn't president. America's rising. We have the best economy in the world. And since I've come to office, our GTP is up, our trade deficit with China is down to the lowest point in over a decade. And we're standing up against China's unfair economic practices. We're standing up for peace and stability across the Taiwan Straits. I revitalized our partnership and alliance in the Pacific. India, Australia, Japan, South Korea, Pacific Islands. I've made sure that the most advanced American technologies can't be used in China, not allowing to trade them there. Frankly, for all this tough talk on China, it never occurred to my predecessor to do any of that. I want competition with China, not conflict. And we're in a stronger position to win the conflict of the 21st century against China than anyone else for that matter, than any time as well. Here at home, I've signed over 400 bipartisan bills. But there's more to pass my unity agenda. Strengthen penalties on fentanyl trafficking. You don't want to do that, huh? Pass bipartisan privacy that says to protect our children online. Oh, by the way, what he's referencing here, um, oh, what is that called? The online. What is the name of that uh, current law? I always forget this one. Does anybody have the name of that one offhand? It's called like the, the like Keep Children Safe Online Act. Oh my God, it's deranged. Okay, it's one of those. Uh, it's one of those laws that uh, it. You remember? Do you guys remember um, SOPA, PIPA, and COSA a couple years ago? 
those laws that were like, we need to keep children on safe online. And then it turns out that they were like massive censorship bills that would basically uh, give private corporations and the government the ability to basically strike down anything with very little oversight. Is it COSA? Is that the current one? Is COSA? Maybe that's the one I'm thinking of. Yeah, the COSA, the Kids Online Safety Act. The, the COSA Act is, it is like, <laughs> it is it is one of those laws where it's like uh, the name of it, they design it so that if you criticize it, they can be like, you're crazy. You don't want to protect children. It basically, the COSA Act uh, is, is designed to basically force companies to purge anything that is like inappropriate for minors in incredibly broad strokes. It's, it's basically uh, uh, it's basically an attempt to, and one of the things that they fixate on is that like, they don't want you to be able to like, in general access sites, they don't believe you should be able to discuss sexuality, which by the way, would mean that basically any channel that is led by a gay person would be targeted by this. Because uh, I don't know if you guys remember this, but uh, YouTube for a very long time was forcibly and secretly tagging any video made by any LGBT person as having the topic of sexuality, um, just inherently, uh, which is one of the main tactics uh, that, that the Republicans like to use now. They like to use a rhetorical tactic of framing anything that has to do with being trans or being gay as inherently sexual and therefore inherently dangerous to minors. Like anything at all. You, a, a trans person working at McDonald's, their existence is sexual and therefore they shouldn't be allowed to do that. And this is, this bill uh, operates using similar language. So it's crazy that Joe Biden is signing off on this type of stuff. Isn't YouTube still doing that? Uh, it's impossible to prove in full at this point, but uh, likely yes. And there has always been an issue with um, uh, extremely hard uh, uh, and unfair judgment of any topic that even remotely touches sexuality and sexual health or um, even just discussions, br like broad discussions of the existence of sexuality or gender identity. Um, these types of laws don't actually protect kids. They only, um, they only damage, they only create uh, a, a carve out for people to be targeted unjustly and then ramp up moral Puritan, uh, um, moral Puritan based um, censorship. The, the goal is like, uh, the goal is to indirectly uh, grant control to the uh, to very specific moral positions, like for example, Christian morality, uh, with no regard to people's actual rights, and they just use children as an excuse. None of the rules that are put in place here actually protect children. None of them are are like like impossible to circumvent. None of them actually give children uh, 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 any real safety. They're just designed to basically give control to the most morally conservative in the country by law. No surprise really in this case that Joe Biden is getting behind of these types of laws. I should do a whole segment on this, honestly. Uh, off the cuff right now, uh, I feel like I'm not doing the best job arguing this. So I'll have to do a segment in the future specifically about this bill going into deep detail. But these, um, but the like COSA, SOPA, PIPA, these bills and all of their variants, there have been multiple attempted bills that are like pitched to protect children online. And then you look into the actual bill and it has absolutely nothing to do with actually protecting children. Oh yeah, here's an article from the EFF. Don't fall for the latest changes to the dangerous Kids Online Safety Act. The author of this bill unveiled an amended version, but it's still an unconstitutional censorship bill that continues to empower state officials to target services and online content they don't like. 
COSA remains a dangerous bill that would allow the government to decide what types of information can be shared and read online by everyone. It would still require an enormous number of websites, apps, and online platforms to filter and block legal and important speech. It would most certainly still result in age verification requirements. Some of its pre uh, provisions have changed over time. Oh, yeah, I think at one point COSA was trying to push through a law that if you wanted to access a porn website at all, you would have to upload your driver's license. Like you would have to, if you want to go as an adult, go to on your computer and watch fucking porn, you would have to upload your driver's license to that fucking website. I'm pretty sure that was in the original text of the older version of the COSA. Is that still in the current version? All right, this is a stun lock, but seriously, it's actually wild. A pillow says that's how it is currently in my state right now in North Carolina. Holy shit. I didn't even realize that North Carolina actually passed that law. That's fucking crazy. That was also passed under the guise of protecting kids. Jesus fucking Christ. That's how it is here in Utah. What the fuck? That's, it's actually insane to me that people are so scared of the existence of pornography that they feel like you need to, in the comfort of your own home, you would need to upload a fucking driver's license to be able to look at porn. That's insane. That's, that's fucking crazy. And of course, a lot, a lot of these laws are designed to be able to take down resources, to be able to, to be able to be used aggressively by people who want to take down resources completely separate from talking about being able to just use your adult right to access the materials that you want online, uh, completely separate from that. These, these laws are also used to be, to basically cater to the lowest common denominator to people who have nothing else better to do than to go online and report websites for being problematic in some way or another, which ultimately uh, will often target, as we've seen with the book banning situation, the book banning situation, all of the book bans were done under the guise of protecting children. And then a handful of, of, of hyper-Christian fundamentalist psychopaths who spend all of their time reporting every single book that has even a shred of a gay person appearing in it as dangerous. And all of a sudden, there's no one there to push back because a couple of lifeless freaks backed by fucking coke money or whatever can sit there and spend all day looking for every reference to a gay person in a book and then justify it using their their own personal moral worldview this is dangerous and the law is there to favor them All right, let's fucking do this. Let's move on. We got to finish this shit. I've been going for fucking ever. It's Harness. five hours into the stream. Jesus Christ. Harness the promise of AI to protect us from peril. Ban AI voice impersonations and more. And keep our truly sacred obligation to train and equip those we send into harm's way and care for them and their families when they come home and when they don't. <laughs> That's why the song Support and Help of Dennis and the VA, I signed the PACT Act. One of the most significant laws ever. Helping millions of veterans expose the toxins who now are battling more than 100 different cancers. Many of them don't come home, but we owe them and their families support. We owe it to ourselves to keep supporting our new health research agency called ARPA-H. And remind us, remind us that we can do big things like end cancer as we know it, and we will.
Let me close with this. Yay. I know you don't want to hear any more, Lindsay, but I got to say a few more things. I know it may not look like it, but I've been around a while. <laughs> when you get to be my age, certain things become clearer than ever. I know the American story. Again and again, I've seen the contest between competing forces in the battle for the soul of our nation, between those who want to pull America back to the past and those who want to move America into the future. My lifetime has taught me to embrace freedom and democracy, a future based on core values that have defined America, honesty, decency, dignity, equality, to respect everyone, to give everyone a fair shot, to give hate no safe harbor. Now, other people my age see it differently. The American story of resentment, revenge, and retribution, that's not me. I was born in mid-World War II when America stood for the freedom of the world. I grew up in Scranton, Pennsylvania, in Claymont, Delaware, among working-class people who built this country. I watched in horror as two of my heroes, like many of you did, Dr. King and Bobby Cunningham, were assassinated. And their legacies inspired me to pr pr pursue a, cure, a career in service. I left the law firm, became a public wow. defender, because my city of Wilmington was the only city in America occupied by the National Guard wow. after Dr. King was assassinated because of the riots. And I became a county councilman almost by accident. I got elected to the United States Senate when I had no intention of running at age 29. Then vice president, our first black president. Now president to the first women vice president. The energy's winding down. The two cars doing it. In my career, I've been told I was too young. <laughs> By the way, they didn't let me on ascended elevators for votes sometimes. They're not a joke. And I've been told I'm too old. Whether young or old, I've always been known. I've always known what endures. I've known our North Star. The very idea of America is that we're all created equal and deserves to be treated equally throughout our lives. We've never fully lived up to that idea, but we've never walked away from it either. And I won't walk away from it now. I'm optimistic. I really am. I'm optimistic, Nancy. My fellow Americans, the issue facing our nation isn't how old we are, it's how old are our ideas. Hate, anger, revenge, retribution are the oldest of ideas. But you can't lead America with ancient ideas that only take us back. You lead America, the land of possibilities, you need a vision for the future and what can and should be done. Tonight you've heard mine. All right, all right, okay. I don't need to hear his last little wrap up here. We gotta do, we gotta make time, okay? Oh Jesus, what have I done to myself? All right, we have a hot mic, Biden a hot mic after the speech people told me to listen to. Let's hear it out. This is one of the great speeches. I was telling the secretary, you know, I was in Jordan and uh, Israel this weekend, and we just, you know, we got to keep pushing what you're doing on the humanitarian stuff and all this stuff. So I told him, baby, I'm going to this. I said, baby, you know, I'm going to come to Jesus. Sure, just. I'm going to have my head good. That was good. Okay. Okay. He said, we're going to have a come to Jesus moment. Uh, okay. 
and then he said, oh, I'm on a hot mic. That seems staged. That's a really fucking weird thing to say. And it's also really weird that he goes, oops, I'm on a hot mic. That's good. Okay. We'll see. I don't, I'll, I'll believe it when I see it. They, there has Nancy Pelosi did this weird thing too. Nancy Pelosi did this thing where she was like, that BB Netanyahu, I don't even want to call him Mr. Because I don't even respect him. He's such a naughty boy. And I don't like him. And it was, it meant nothing. They didn't do anything. They just kind of said, he's a naughty boy. Ah. And it was just kind of like, oh, okay. Uh, let's see it, dude. You have all the power in this situation. You have all the fucking power.